Hey everybody, welcome to Adapt or Perish, episode 79, The Adams Family. We hope everyone had a very spooky and exceptionally safe and responsible Halloween this year, and we are excited to celebrate the holiday with this, the creepiest and kookiest family around. But before we come to see him, we need to talk about our next episode. If I had to make a list of my all-time top five properties that started as a book, then became a movie, and finally became a streaming series, High Fidelity would be on that list, probably. And that's what we'll be looking at next. We'll be talking about Nick Hornby's original 1995 novel, the 2000 movie starring John Cusack, and the 2020 series starring Zoe Kravitz. We probably won't spend much time on the musical, full disclosure. That'll be out in two weeks on Tuesday, November 17th. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections about today's episode or any others that you'd like to hear on the show, remember to email adapterparishcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, we'd love it if you would share that with the world by leaving a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. We're also on Patreon at patreon.com slash adaptcast. We've got a patron-only community and our bi-weekly bonus show, Adapter Parish Plus, with episodes releasing every Tuesday between episodes of this show. We hope you check it out. Show notes from this and all other episodes can be found at adapterparishcast.com. And with that, on with the show, Adapter Parish, Episode 79, The Adams Family. Hello and welcome to Adapter Parish, a podcast about adaptation. I'm Jeremy Latour. And I'm Arielle Lipshaw. And this is a public service announcement. Yeah. Vote and get your flu shot. I mean, yeah, like if you're hearing this on the day that it comes out. You still have time. Yeah. To the, do both. The flu shot you have a little more leeway on. Yeah. Vote, not so much. But we would be remiss not to say, because you could be listening to this on the morning of election day and still be thinking, eh, should I vote? And the answer is yes. Yeah. And you should vote for Biden. Let's make that clear. Let's just be very clear. Just another time capsule. Like anyone listening. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Something more important that we need to talk about. The Adams Family? Uh, Well, happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. We happy Halloween after the fact. Yeah, I'm going to take the fall for this one. I messed up the schedule Mm. a little bit. Uh, And by the time we realized that I had messed up the schedule, it was sort of too late to change course the other thing i want to cop to um and i don't know how often we mention things that we almost did but didn't for the show yeah um this was very nearly an episode about the shining (laughs) it is not as you may see for the reason that so okay i'm gonna spend two minutes talking about the shining okay for those of you that wish this was an episode about the shining i'm gonna throw you a bone i got A quarter of the way into the book, I would say. And I said to Jeremy, do you remember when you took me to see Mad Max Fury Road in the theater? And I said, this is like torture. And you said, well, we should have left. And I said, yeah, that's what this is like. It's like torture. I feel like I'm being tortured by reading this book. I I, I only quibble a little bit. I feel like you didn't sell it that hard. Yeah. When we spoke of it. In my mind, that's how I was feeling which i which i appreciate yes in retrospect and as an illustration of the fact that i probably didn't sell it that hard his response was something to the effect of well i don't know you just gotta get through it and i was like all right i guess he's very devoted to the shining i guess we'll just keep struggling through it i mean because the way you sold it to me was "Ooh, this is rough yeah and i was like yeah it is rough you're right yeah and then Jeremy went away and read. I mean, how much? How far did you get into the book? A tenth of the way. Yeah, they didn't even get to the. They didn't even get to the overlook. Yeah, and he came to me and he said, "You have to tell me right now if you don't want to do this because this is rough." And I said, "I don't want to do it," and we didn't. And the reason is because I remembered that there was scary shit in a hotel i've seen the movie i had read the book before which is amazing to me because i have never read the book nor seen the movie yeah i saw the nbc miniseries yeah i did not i think it was nbc but i had both seen the movie and read the book and i remembered the scary shit i didn't remember the child abuse that was the part that i did not had not taken in because i was not you'll understand someday uh i was not a parent and i could not really deal with the abuse and neglect of the little boy 
by his parents. That that was too much for me. So we didn't do The Shining. So we didn't do The Shining. So we needed to come up Long with something else. Long story short, we didn't do The Shining. So we needed something else uh, spoopy. Spooky for this late, late belated Halloween spooky. episode. Spooky. During a time when no one is thinking about anything fun or Halloween. You don't know that. Uh, I don't think there's many Halloween parties that are happening. No, well, I hope not. There mm-hmm. probably are a Halloween party. That there probably are. That's the I don't want to get into it. I, okay, I would rather talk about the Adams family. Okay, and can I tell you why I'd rather talk about the Adams family? Yeah, because we have so much to talk about. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Yeah, there is more than I thought there was. Yeah, you came to me a few moments ago and said we're gonna have to bang through this because uh, there's a lot. Like, and I said let's do it. There's there's maybe like three that I want to spend some time on. Not all because not not because I enjoyed them all, mm-hmm. but because I think they're worth spending time on. Yeah. But I think we gotta I think we gotta motor. All I think right. we gotta get going. Um, let's do it. So what's your what 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 up until now uh, was your experience of the Adams family? Because I think this is the big thing that we kind of discovered doing all of this, which is the Adams family means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah. Because there is so much the Adams family. Yeah. So my experience of the Adams family was the uh nineteen nineties movie which is one of my favorites and which I will drop anything to watch. I will watch it anytime. When you say it, do you mean like the first one or the first one? Like like Adam's well, Family I was and Adam's Family to, Values. I was, I, that was coming to that. Oh, I'm sorry. So the first movie, The Adam's Family, which we owned on VHS tape as a child, and the movie The Adam's Family Values, which I had seen many, many times, not quite as many times because we did not own the Adams Family Values on VHS tape, just the Adams Family, um, but which I almost think is almost a superior film, um, which oh, well, we'll, we'll get to, which it. we'll get to. Mm-hmm. But uh, as I say, seen both of those movies multiple times, would watch them again. Literally, want to watch them right now. Mm-hmm. Like, like <laughs> I feel like that's the sign of a good uh, movie. Is that at the point that we're recording the podcast, talking about it makes me want to go and watch it again. And that's only happened a couple of times. Usually I'm really sick of the thing. It seems like your experience of the Addams Family is really just those two movies. Uh, yes, I would say so. And not all the other stuff. No. And I, this is the point where I would love to say, oh, ha, ha, well, my experience is, uh, I, I know so much more Addams Family than you do. Because I... Also grew up on Ad- on the Adams Family and Adams Family Values, mm-hmm. but I also was into the comic. I see because we got when I was a kid. Uh, after I saw the movies, uh, we were in New York, and there was an exhibit at uh, the I want to say it was the New York Public Library, and it was like an art exhibit, and it was of Charles Adams like comics, mm-hmm. his original like New Yorker comics. And we went, and I was like, these are dark and fun because I'm twelve, mm-hmm. and. There was the book that you could get of all his uh, comics that had ever appeared in the New Yorker, and I remember my mom and dad were like, "Well, you got you should we should get that for you." Mm-hmm. I read this book cover to cover so many fucking times when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I love th- I love this book of Charles Adams cartoons. Um, and so when we did this episode, I remember we we posted about it on the the Slack. Um, on the patron Slack, right? And someone said, "Like you got to talk about the New Yorker cartoons. I don't know where you could get those." I'm like, "Oh, I I own that already." Mm-hmm. This is where I would go on to say, and I also watched the '60s show and the cartoon, and then the later. So I that was it. Like my experience was exactly the same as yours, except I also had the book. Yeah, there it so is. So I'm not coming from a position of knowing that much more about the Adams family than you. Sure, sure, sure. To be because to be as clear as possible. Okay. So I think, so this is usually where we kind of jump into the plot, which of course we can't do because all of these have different plots, Mm -hmm. but maybe we can just briefly explain for anyone that doesn't know who, who are the Adams family? Who, who is they? Well, uh, if I was going to explain who the Adams family are and as they first appeared, like in the Mm thirties, because they appeared just to be clear, like Charles Adams wrote uh, comic strips for the New Yorker for decades upon decades. Yeah. And the Adams family were like, part they were like one of the recurring sets of characters yeah um and it became the one he was most famous for it's they're a family yeah they didn't even have names yeah to yeah be clear. to be clear like the comics are all like single image they're new one, yorker strips yeah, yeah one page comics so it's like an a drawing with like a sentence underneath and that's it it's like it's like the equivalent of like one-liner jokes yeah. right 
Um, and yeah, and that was the thing that most surprised me. I came to you and I was like, when did they get names? Because I guess I always assumed that the comics, which I had not seen before, like the, the TV show where they all have names, obviously, was based on the comics. But like those names of the characters that have persisted from the 60s until now, those were invented for that television show, if I'm if I'm correct. That's my understanding of yeah. it. Um, I'm going to say that a lot this episode because there isn't a lot of scholarly stuff about the Adams Family. Shame. Yeah. So, yes, my, my understanding is at this point is that when they were doing the TV show, um, so the, the TV show, let's skip right to the TV show. Because okay. the comic's great and I think anyone should read it, especially if you're fans of kind of any version of the Adams Family. Yeah. Because... Almost all of the comics, almost all of those jokes at some point make their way into the movies, yeah, for example. Yeah, they're just weird, dark comics, like, sort of setting up a one-liner of a joke about somebody being kind of dark. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. what it is. You've described a New Yorker cartoon. Well, the uh, I mean, we can talk, we'll, we'll get into it more, I'm sure, like, which things go back to the, to the comics, but I... As someone who watched all of these and then sat down and read the comics, the the little details that were in some of the adaptations that came clearly directly from the comics really impressed me. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were watching, and we'll get into more details, obviously. But just this is the episode where we're getting ahead of ourselves. Just as a single example, I remember well, just because we were watching the Adams Family, the 1990s movie with Christina Ricci, and she's. Went playing Wednesday and going to bed and I was like I love that like octopus on the end of her bed I've always loved that design and that's from the comics like the little girls in bed yeah. and there's like an octopus drawn on the end of her bed anyway totally con- continue so uh, that's the comic let's get to the tv show though because I think the tv show it's weird for me too that you could take something that is like the new yorker is not something that is wildly popular yeah that's not I wouldn't even call that pop culture like it's snooty it's for a certain type of person yeah and I think that's really borne out by the content too because the Adams family was always this comment on like upper middle class like like rich people Mm -hmm. it's just a comment on like rich people who don't have a care in the world it's like well what if they were also very dark yeah so it's this kind of inversion then you have people who like well we love the comic we think this could be a tv show so we're gonna make it very very pop culture we're gonna make it very mass market and i feel like that's a thing that keeps happening where it keeps getting reinvented for a different audience Because I don't think the audience for the TV show is the audience for the original New Yorker cartoons. Yeah. But they both were successful and they were both kind of loved and influential in their own way. Yeah. So you had someone who loved a thing. And so this was created by David Levy. Um, It uh, was the the producer, uh, the like executive producer on the show, I think is worth mentioning. This is a guy named Nat Perrin. He was a friend of Groucho Marx. And he had also been a writer on a bunch of Marx Brothers movies. Uh-huh. And knowing that makes the show make a little more sense to me. Uh-huh. Because I think it has that same kind of anarchic thing to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you have these people who Similar are like... Similar energy. Exactly. Like, the way the Adams Family are defined, it's like, they're just... They're crazy. Yeah. They're crazy. They're doing their thing. But like... And, and the comedy in so many uh, parts comes from the way they interact with people outside of the family. Right, 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 right. And it's not that they're... They're not evil. They're not bad. They're great. They're just dark. Yeah. And different. Yes. And they they also think, they think everyone else is as weird as they are. Yeah, yeah. Which I kind of love, but but yeah. Yeah, no, well, I read something. This is, I'm not the first person to say this because I actually read something about this, but like <laughs> the the subversiveness of the show, like it just goes to show how different this show was for the 60s um, because like the reason it's kind of subversive as a family show is that it portrays a husband who really, really loves his wife, thinks she's smart and interesting, shares her interests, and wants to bone her all the time, yeah. and she's into it. <laughs> like, like name me another show that that's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. From I, that time period especially. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to. It's just not how this stuff worked. Like, you had, you had couples where they clearly love each other, mm-hmm. but not with this kind of passion. Yeah, this is like a physical passion. And, like... The sex jokes are kind of explicit. Like, like there was one where, especially for the 60s, I was a little shocked. Like, there was one part where Morticia said, like, oh, what should we do now or something like that? And Gomez looks at her, raises his eyebrows, kisses her arm and goes, I have an idea. Like, they're clearly talking about sex. Clearly. Um, like, kinky sex uh, on TV in the 60s and in a black and white television show. And I was, I was 
flabbergasted. Were you scandalized? I, I mean, I was I was not scandalized. I was pleased. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. But let's get to the characters for a second. Yes, because yes. as we were saying- We're like, ahead of ourselves. Like the characters are all in it, but the names came from Charles Adams, apparently. Apparently he suggested all of them. But from what I could see, it's not like he named all of them for the show. He provided suggestions for the names. Sure. It sounded like he had a really- kind of a nice idea of the fact that he's like, no, you're going to go off and you're going to do your thing. I'm here to kind of guide you in the direction that I think makes the most sense, but I'm going to let you make choices. Yeah. So for example, apparently he had two ideas for what Gomez's name would be. Mm -hmm. And for one of them, he thought, well, he's kind of Spanish. And the other, he thought he might be Italian. Okay. And he told both of the names. And John Aston, the guy who ended up playing Gomez, he told him. And he was like, well, I like Gomez better. Great. So apparently he gave them choices and John Aston picked Gomez. Okay. Which, so we have Gomez the father. Yeah, Gomez Adams. So I'm going to ask you a question. And it's like a little intentionally hard to answer. Oh, God. Okay. Because we watch so many different versions. Yeah. But what would you say... I'm going to ask you for, like, commonalities. Yeah. How would you describe the character of Gomez in terms of the things that are common to him across all versions? He's madly in love with his wife and wants to bone her all the time. Uh Uh-huh. And he really respects her and thinks she's great. Mm -hmm. Um, Is he a passionate man? He is passionate. Passionate. Mm -hmm. Loves his family. He is sort of willfully oblivious to how weird other people think he is. Um, and just lives in his truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, he likes to play with swords. And trains. <laughs> and trains. The trains are kind of always Loves there. Loves trains. Yeah. And I don't think he always likes to stand on his head. I think that might just be the 60s one. I think so. Um, but he's into like sort of BDSM-y, torture-y things. Well, they all are. Yeah. That's kind of a thing for all of them. Um, and he has a brother named Fester. Well, well hang on. No, you're no. right. He's not always his brother. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's the thing. So, okay. So let's move on to Morticia. Yeah. Uh, how would you, what are the commonalities of Morticia? Oh, uh, do, do you want me to like describe him physically also? Uh, sure. He usually has a mustache. Yes. He has dark hair with, that's like slick back. Yep. And he wears either like a, a like a pinstripe, uh, double breasted suit or like a smoking jacket. Yeah. And a cigar. Right. Always has a cigar. Uh, a lot of times. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Morticia. Morticia, his wife. His wife. Um, she likes to commune with the dark spirits and join their hellish crusade. Mm-hmm. Um, she is always portrayed as having very very pale skin. And long black hair and wearing a dark skin tight dress with a lot of cleavage. Mm-hmm. She likes to cut the heads off of roses. <laughs> and she's, I feel like Morticia's a little less family oriented than Gomez is. Like he's really big on like his kids and his family. And she's like a little bit more, she's a little colder. She's not as warm, I don't think, as Gomez. You know what? I think you're, I think you're looking at the movies. No. I'm thinking of the TV show. I mean, she's into her kids, but like, I just think she's a little less emotional. I just found her so warm in the TV show. She she is warm, but I think she's a little less emotional than Gomez. Okay. Yeah. I was, but. Maybe I'm projecting. On the flip side, I think she was more emotional than I expected her to be. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. In in, in the movies, she's very stoic. Yeah. But in the, like, in the shows, in so many other versions of it, she has a lot of personality. She has a very interesting, in the show particularly, which is, I guess, what we're talking about, she has a very interesting physicality. Like, her arms are always crossed in a very particular way, and Mm -hmm. her, she can only take, like, tiny little steps because her dress is so tight. Played Uh, by Carolyn Jones, by the way. Yeah, who died really young. Apparently. She died at 53. Yeah. Um, like, I think her last appearance, uh, as certainly as Morticia, was like in 1977, there was a Halloween special uh-huh. where they did a reunion. Yeah. And I don't know that she was alive much longer than that. And John Astin still, still kicking. Still kicking. What a, what a trooper, man. He's, uh, check, let me check my notes. He's 130 years old, He's the man not. is. <laughs> He's not. He- well, the funny thing about John Astin was I couldn't quite place him because I knew, obviously, he had the same last name as Sean Astin. Yeah. And I and I knew that Patty Duke was Sean Aston's mother, but I guess I didn't quite understand how John Aston could be Sean Aston's father because if I think of the '60s, Patty Duke was the little girl playing Helen Keller, and uh, John Aston was already a whole adult playing Gomez Adams. But it turns out uh, John Aston was 16 years older than Patty Duke, which explains the whole thing. Um, sure does. Anyway, sorry, that was just a little mental thing that we I have had to get so through. So much to get through. He's a whole adult. I'm enjoying that phrase. That's, John, a, that's new. John Aston is a delightful person. He's still alive. He's going to come up multiple times. He's, yeah. What was the really sweet thing you read about uh, him saying like why he watches the show? Oh, yeah. This And this was from like 2012. So yeah. it's from a while ago. He said, um, yeah, I'm 
I'm the only one left. I'm the only adult still alive. So sometimes I just watch it to like remember my friends. Just, and uh, it was very sweet. And then my entire heart broke. And he said he gets recognized because he thinks he has, an un- he has a distinctive shaped head, which he does. It is a triangle. Yeah. It is absolutely a triangle. Yeah. So anyway, Gomez Morticia. Fester, you mentioned. Yes. Who is Uncle Fester, but sometimes he is... Morticia's uncle. Som- and sometimes he's Gomez's brother. Right. But he is Fester... Don't take too long describing Fester. How would you describe Fester? He's bald. He's pale. He wears like sort of a long overcoat all the time. Mm -hmm. And he can light a light bulb by putting it in his mouth. And he is the creepiest man alive. Oh, and he has like really dark circles around his eyes. Yeah. Very, very creepy. Into dark stuff. Like he makes the rest of them look kind of normal. Like I feel like they make him look creepier. Right. And they're all creepy. Yeah. But they're all. They're creepy and they're kooky. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that in a second. So uh, there's Fester, uh, Uncle Fester. There is, um, there's the two kids. Yeah. Wednesday Wednesday and Pugsley. Pugsley. Wednesday is really witchy, just like Morticia. Mm -hmm. Um, She's into, she's into, she's more into murderousness, I think, than Morticia is. But is she? Yeah, in not the show? in the show. Yeah, and I don't know. Like, Maybe I don't, not. I don't think so. Like, I think that's a thing. I'm sorry. Like, okay. I'm sorry that I'm quibbling. But like, it's okay. You don't have to be sorry. But like, well, in the uh, show, Wednesday is younger than Pugsley, and I don't think we saw another version where Wednesday was the younger child. But I feel like the show really hues to the comic because in the comic strip, Wednesday's very innocent. Yeah, like she's kind of into dark things, but she's always portrayed like her face is always very innocent. Yeah, she doesn't have that like evil kind of thing about her. Yeah. That we see later. Yeah. That we kind of define Wednesday by. So like Wednesday was kind of nice yeah. early on. Yeah. Just yeah. like the rest of the family, they're into dark stuff. Yeah. And Pugsley always wears a striped shirt. And he's just a like kind of dumb little boy. <laughs> That's his whole thing. Yeah. And in later versions, like I, I hate to say this, but like it seemed like they didn't really know what to do with Pugsley sometimes. And like just made his defining characteristic that he was really fat. Yeah. Which was always kind of strange to me. I think because, it's, it's a mark of poor writing. Yeah, I think so. Because like, yeah, the this actor happened to be a little bit tubby but like it had nothing to do with his character you Mm -hmm. know what i mean like anyway so there's two more people in the household yeah there's grandmama yeah uh grandmama frump yes well so this is another thing where she's like because frump is morticia's maiden name oh is it sometimes she's morticia's mom and sometimes she's gomez's mom Mm -hmm. in this one she's gomez's mother yeah which they define so fester is morticia's uncle and Grandmama is Gomez's mom. Got it. And then there's Lurch, the, the butler. butler, who, this is the funny thing. So we watched, the, we watched like, would you say like a dozen episodes of the show? Yeah, something like that. 10, 10 or 12, something like that. And we watched a selection and we watched some, some episodes from season two. It, was, it only ran for two seasons, 1964 to 1966. We watched season two first and it was clear that like something Lurch said in the first season had turned into more of a catchphrase in the second season. Yeah. Because like, so what, what happens? Morticia brings the butler's bell and Lurch arrives and says, you rang? And in the first season, it's, you rang? And in the second season, it's, you rang? I mean, it's like even more. It's, it's, it's so much more than that. You rang? It's so much more of a catchphrase. Yeah. Like clearly more of a catchphrase. Lurch ended up being my favorite character <laughs> in the original TV show. We watched well, we watched Lurch, an episode where he falls in love. Yeah, I was going to say we we watched an episode where he actually got a plot line. It was amazing. Yeah. He's just he was great. Lurch ended up being such a fun character. And I found out so he's played by an actor named Ted Cassidy. Uh he also was Thing. Oh, that's fun. In the show. So the hand, they have this hand. A disembodied hand. A disembodied hand that only lives in boxes. Like which makes sense yeah. if it's 1964. For, for the budget they had at the time. But apparently the only other, the only times where he didn't play Thing was when Lurch was on set. Got it. And so Thing had to be played by one of the producers, I think. But I thought that was funny that he played both of those characters. It's great. Um, I want to talk about one particular episode because I think it sort of encapsulates some of the themes that we're going to see over and over and over again. And sure. it's the way that the Addams Family interacts with outsiders Mm -hmm. it's the episode where this is the one that really stuck with me where like there's a guy from the insurance company that keeps coming over to their house fester accidentally burns their bear yeah they have a big stuffed bear fester burns it so they call the insurance company because they want a new bear and the insurance company says how much and they say how much what are you talking about And they say money and they're like we don't want money we have money yeah we want a bear but there's this sort of underling at the insurance company that is sort of in trouble for letting their policy not 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 
yeah exactly not canceling their policy yeah because they're so weird and the insurance company doesn't want to deal with them and one thing leads to another and he like gets fired from the insurance company and they're like oh we want to help you like let us get you a job we can send you to any of these like places around the world that gomez has business interests and they're like trying so hard to help let me rearrange your hat let, let, let's refurnish your house while your wife isn't home like all of these like crazy things and this guy does not want their home <laughs> is not interested but they're so nice but so oblivious to how weird they are yeah. and i think that's just that just sums it up they're really really nice really really weird they want to be friends but they don't understand why people don't want to be friends with them mm -hmm. And I think it, I, I love that you're hitting on this because that this is we can't say that this is the correct way that the Adams family should be portrayed. But I would say it turned out to be our favorite way that the Adams family was portrayed. Yes. Like the most interesting way. Yeah. Because if they're mean spirited and Charles Adams said this, too, when they were making the show, um, they're not evil. Yeah. They're they're just dark. They're just dark. And they like the things that they like. Yeah. But they don't really. They, they they don't spend their entire time judging people who aren't them. Yeah. And they don't they don't really wish harm upon people, even though, like I even said this at one point, like, I'd love to go to a party at the Adams house. You know what? No, I might die. Yeah. Like, there is always a chance that you, it's kind of like Hogwarts. Yeah. Where, like, you don't, don't There's real danger. Don't go. You actually might die. You really shouldn't. And they'll feel bad for a minute if you die. Oh, they'll feel really bad yeah. for a minute. Yeah. Because uh, they're good people. Because they're really nice. But, like, Salt the also... Earth. You know, they'll be happy for you that you've gone on to seek out the dark forces and join their hellish crusade. Right. Yeah. So that's the thing I love about them. If So if we run into a version of the Adams family where they're like actively mean spirited and actively like wishing harm on people and dark, like it just doesn't sit well. Yeah. They're good people. Yeah. They're really nice. So that was 1964 to 1966. Yes. And I know we spent a lot of time on that, but we really had to, we want to set the stage. That's essentially the one of the original properties yeah one thing i will say about this before we move on that i thought was just fascinating because i think the new yorker is this amazing property that like occasionally has amazing stuff in it oftentimes has amazing stuff in it and i love the cartoons but boy some of the people who work there are uh condescending jerks good you know which I mean, are you surprised by that no it's i was the new yorker. literally about to say i'm not surprised by that so william sean was the editor of the new yorker yeah that's wallace sean's dad oh for real yeah. Friend of the pod? Friend of the pod. Wallace Shawn's yes. dad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm about to dunk on Wallace Shawn's dad, oh. who was a condescending asshole. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Did you know that during the original television run of The Addams Family, no Addams Family comics appeared in The New Yorker? Why? Because his whole thing was it's targeted at a more refined readership, and he did not want it to be associated with characters who could be seen on television by just anybody. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. Fuck that guy. Yep. Uh, and apparently in 1987, after he died, the characters came back. So I think they weren't in The New Yorker for decades Wow! because of this prick. Did you not know that William Sean was Wallace Sean's dad? I didn't know who William Sean was. That's fair. <laughs> Why would I have thought I of guess... it? I don't stay up night wondering about who Wallace Sean's dad is. I guess is. let me phrase that a different way. Do you know who Mandy Patinkin's uncle is? No. Because I don't I know. I guess let me phrase that a different way. Did you not know that Wallace Sean's dad was the longtime editor of The New Yorker? No, I did not know that. Gotcha. Dad, no, no clue. No clue whatsoever. So let's move on. Okay, so let's blow through uh, the, this next one kind of fast. Quick peek behind the curtain. Uh, I'm not going to lie. What did you just turn to me and say? I said, can you just look it up real quick? Because I'm like 99% sure that I'm right. But I want to, I, I just made a big deal about it. So let's be sh be sure. Yeah, William Sean is Wallace Sean's father. Yes. Let's let's be clear. So uh, the Adams family didn't appear on television for a number of years. And then Hanna-Barbera got them. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't get their own show at first. Basically, Hanna-Barbera made a series of uh, uh, TV movies uh, starring the Scooby-Doo gang mm -hmm. called the New Scooby-Doo Movies. And so in 1992, they met the Adams family. We did not watch this. No. We, well, I watched some clips from it. Did you? And like, it's fine. It's it's Hanna-Barbera. It, yeah. It's literally, it would not surprise you. It is exactly what every Hanna-Barbera era show from the 70s was mm -hmm. which is like really bad animation the jokes are like not super good and there's from what i can remember a laugh track which is always weird. doesn't sit well with me especially in a cartoon that's very yeah. strange if i'm wrong about that i apologize in advance but i'm pretty sure it had that that's fine then they got their own show um so this was in 1973 and the show did some weird things like the show. They didn't live in a mansion anymore. The entire family lived in a Victorian era RV. 
And so it was like a road show. That's really weird. And I want to tell you about some of the people who were in it. We uh, didn't watch this, by the way. I just want to be very clear. I watched clips from it. Okay. It's, it's not like easily accessible. I think you can get it on DVD, but like not on streaming or anything like that. Uh, here were some things that it did. Fester became Gomez's brother in the show. Mm -hmm. So from what I can see, it's the first time that that became canon. Gotcha. Any kind of canon. Grandmama became Morticia's mother. Okay. So these are things that hold true through a lot of different versions. Yep. Seemingly introduced here. Yep. Uh, Jackie Coogan and Ted Cassidy were in it. Jackie Coogan, famous uh, child star Jackie yes. Coogan of yeah. the silent era, played Fester in the TV show. Yeah. And did the voice of Fester here. They named a whole law after him. Yeah. Yeah. Because of like, what was it? Because his parents stole all his money. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But then he got that sweet, sweet Adams family cash. Uh, Ted Cassidy came back as Lurch, mm -hmm. uh, which is an easy job to do. Do you know who played Pugsley? No. 10-year-old Jodie Foster. Oh, that's fun. Isn't that adorable? That's really cute. Yeah. Uh, so that's the Hanna-Barbera cartoon. It's Hanna-Barbera. I, I don't think it's really worth talking about very much more. And then not a lot happened for a while. Until the 90s? Until 1991. When they made one of the best movies ever? It's, uh, it's pretty good. And by pretty good, I mean it is fucking fantastic. It is so good. Let me talk a little bit about the people that made this movie. And I'm going to tell you one way in which I think we all dodged a bullet. This movie was written by two different people. It was written by Carolyn Thompson. Here are some things that Carolyn Thompson wrote. Edward Scissorhands. Good movie. The Nightmare Before Christmas. There's a theme I'm sensing here. The Corpse Bride. A theme. It was also written by Larry Wilson. Oh, are you about to tell me that Tim Burton almost directed on. this fucking Hang movie? Hang the fuck on. Larry Wilson also wrote this movie. He wrote Beetlejuice. You're about to tell me that Tim Burton almost directed this fucking movie. Tim Burton almost directed this fucking movie. <laughs> that would have been a, a travesty. Like, if you told... 15-year-old me that Tim Burton almost directed The Addams Family, my reaction would have been, we have been robbed. The world has been robbed of great and high art, great and high and weird art. I fucking loved Tim Burton when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I got over that. Yeah. I got over that a number of years I feel ago. like most people do. Well, uh, and I'll tell you why. And it's not because, I'll tell you why I personally got over it. Like, I got over it because... I accepted that the things that I appreciated him for, he's always been good at. Mm -hmm. Like, I like the way he designs a movie. Mm -hmm. I like his sensibility. I like the fact that he likes getting weird. That was the stuff that I really valued when I was younger. Because I had a chip on my shoulder. And, like, I wasn't a Hot Topic kid. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with being a Hot Topic kid. But, like, I don't know. If I had been born 10 years later... I think I might have been a Hot Topic kid. I wanted to be a Hot Topic kid, but mm. I wasn't allowed to spend money there. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. So he almost directed this movie. And again, I am glad he didn't because the thing that I feel that I have discovered at this point is that Tim Burton doesn't know how to tell a story. Mm. I'm drawing that line in the sand. I am going to go ahead and say that. I don't think he knows how to tell a satisfying story. I think all of his movies start well, and I don't think any of them end in a satisfying way. I think the pacing in his movies is pretty... Um, Bad? Inconsistent across the board. Yeah. Like some of his movies I think have good pacing, but some of them have terrible pacing. Yeah. Which tells me that the pacing ultimately isn't up to him. Sure. Um, Like I think his best movie is Sweeney Todd. Mm -hmm. I really think it's his best movie. I think it tells the best story. <laughs> because he didn't he didn't determine the pacing because it's a musical, so the songs are already written for him. Exactly. I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Um yes, we're spending a lot of time on Tim Burton who did not direct The Adams Family. I appreciate that. But I wanted to say that because it was interesting information that I found out. Yes. Turned out it was directed by a guy named Barry Sonnenfeld. Mm -hmm. I want to give Barry Sonnenfeld's CV at this point because this was his first movie. So this is the guy that you have directing. A pr a pretend that you are Raul Julia or uh, Angelica Houston mm -hmm. showing up. Um, you find out that Barry Sonnenfeld is directing this. He and we say who? Yeah, he went on to uh, direct a bunch of movies, including Get Sh His run in the '90s was fucking fantastic. Yeah, because he did Get Shorty, both the Adams Family movies. He did Men in Black. He then he did Wild Wild West, and it kind of gets worse from there. Okay. Um, but holy shit, what 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 a what a bunch of movies to do. Uh, he was a cinematographer though. That was how he started. Mm -hmm. Here's a list of movies he was the cinematographer for, and I want you to think about these in terms of what he is learning from the directors that he's working with. Blood Simple, Coen Brothers, Raising Arizona, Coen Brothers, 
Throw Mama from the Train. Don't know. Danny DeVito. Oh, gotcha. Big. Don't know. Penny Marshall. Okay. When Harry Met Sally. Rob Reiner. Miller's Crossing. Coen Brothers. Misery. Oh, um, uh, Rob, Rob Reiner. Reiner. Yeah. Right? What a bunch of people to study under. Yeah. And then at, like, then he went on to do The Addams Family. Then he switched over to directing. Yeah. But like, I would trust someone who worked with these storytellers. Totally. Because they all know how to tell a story. And holy fuck, he was absolutely the right person for this. Yeah. Uh, this movie had a storied production. I'm going to give you just an example oh, of God. how fucked up this is. So the cinematography is credited to a guy named Owen Roisman. Uh, h- hang on. Let me double check. He actually quit. Uh-huh. And then a guy named Gail Tattersall took over. Mm-hmm. He went into the hospital and so the movie was suddenly left without a cinematographer. Did Barry Sonnenfeld just cinematographer it? He Yes, he shot it. He jumped in? Yeah, he jumped in to shoot it and direct it. Yes. And apparently, th- this was the thing I feel bad about. So it was being produced by Orion Pictures, uh, famously bankrupt. Now I think they're back. The movie was budgeted at $25 million. It went $5 million over budget. And Orion was like, okay, we cannot have a flop on our hands. We are so, we are on the bubble uh, we've got to get rid of this. We've got to offload this because we are going to lose money on this thing. So they sold it. They sold it to Paramount. And Paramount was like, okay, cool. You went over budget, go over budget. Cost $30 million, made $141 million. I bet so, Orion was like, fuck. I think Orion felt bad about that. But this is also something, too. This gets to the rights issues of it, which is something I haven't even brought up. And I'll I'll bring it up now. Not, not that we need to bring it up a lot. But the rights for the Adams Family from what I could tell are odd because (laughs) Charles Adams owns the rights to some of the comics. Uh Uh-huh. The other half of the comics are owned by his ex-wife, the Lady Colleton. Yeah, she's who's always credited as like, thank you to Lady Colleton for all of her support in this production. Because they got divorced and part of the divorce was that she got half the comics. Yeah. And then she married into aristocracy some royalty i don't know some some such thing yeah and the theme song rights are separate from that right so like so much of the stuff that we think of from the tv show well those are owned by that studio yeah so it the rights issues get kind of weird i i struggle to find this because i found it at one point i couldn't really find it again but apparently like the studio didn't actually have the rights to use the you know da 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 they didn't have the rights to that yeah and so they weren't going to use it and then finally enough people were like guys we gotta get We it. can't do the Adams family without da 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 dum. Like we can't. It's weird. And so they did get it. Yeah. Um, this is a good point to go back to that theme song for a second. So this was written by a guy named uh Vic Mizzy. Uh I have beef with this theme song. I think Oh, because it's the lyrics are dumb. The lyrics are fucking stupid. I think musically it's incredible. Like da, it da, is da, da. It is an da, earworm da, da. better than anything I've ever da, heard. Da, da. It is incredible. Da, 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 da. The lyrics are garbage, though. They're creepy and they're kooky, mysterious, spooky. They're all together ooky. ooky. The Adams family. Da, uh, da, da, da. Okay, their house is a museum. When people when come people to see come them. to see them, so like it's not a museum when they don't. Okay. They really are a scream. The Adams family, and then we get the dumbest part of the song. Neat, sweet, petite. So it's like neat. Okay, they're neat. Yeah, sweet. No, not really. Petite. Okay, what the fuck are you even talking about at this point? And that it shows up in so many versions. Like, this is a first draft of a song. Yeah. This, so is, get... this, is, this is, and I've brought this up on the show before, this is Paul McCartney waking up in the morning with scrambled eggs, yeah. and he never turned it into yesterday. Yeah, so get your witch's shawl on, a broomstick you can crawl on? I think so. We're going to pay a call on the Adams family that one makes sense all sung by the way in the like original 60s show by this by the guy with the strongest New York accent in the world yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) I don't know who sings it but it's weird this fucking song but they did get the rights to it so the rights are all weird where like just because it's the Adams family you can't assume that it's going to be able to do all the things that you've seen in the Adams family before and you brought up before about how many of them like reference the comic strips Mm -hmm. I think that's why because Oftentimes, the original comics were the only thing they had the rights to. Sure. So, of course, they're going to mine that for as much as they can. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I do want to point out that the 90s movie made the intelligent choice not to use the lyrics to the song at all. They not only once. used They only used the melody. Not once. Is the MC Hammer version in the first one? I think it's the oh, MC over the Hammer. Credits? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it might be, but that's different. It's not, this, it's, it's not <laughs> in the bulk of the movie itself. Ugh. Okay, so let's talk about the cast. Mm-hmm. 
Roll Julia in one of his last film roles because he died at right out. I think Adam's Family Values was his last movie. And it was. It wasn't. It was a uh, Street Fighter. Okay. Well, fair enough. His last good movie. He was sick during like. Yeah. He was. He was, he was very sick. sick during Adam's Family yeah, Values. Yeah, cancer. I think. Right. I think or so. Some bad thing. Anyway, he died very young. Angelica Houston, like iconic, iconic in this role, like the only Morticia for me. Little Christina Ricci, so good as Wednesday. And this is the this is the origin story of like Wednesdays being really dark and witchy. Yeah. I, I have to believe that like young Fyruza Balk was also up for this role and Christina Ricci got it from her. I think it would make sense. Yeah. Um, because she was a child actor. She she was in a, a different like baby witch movie, I think, as a as a little kid. Was and she then in of the course, worst witch? She was in the worst witch. With Tim Curry. Uh no, that was Thor Birch. Oh, you're right. Yes. Yes, that was Thor Birch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, she was in The Craft, but I think she was in something else before that. Okay. The Craft, by the way, perfect sleepover movie. Um, <laughs> so good. I mean, you don't know, you, like, you don't understand like the middle school girl sleepover thing, but we always watch The Craft. I have nothing against <laughs> The Craft. It's fine. I've seen The Craft so many times, but only at sleepovers. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Jimmy Workman is Pugsley. Jimmy Work, whatever. Uh, he's fine. Oh my god! No, he's actually the best Pugsley that we've seen. Like, he's my favorite. Yeah, Pugsley. he's he's by far the best Pugsley. Um, better than the kid in the the '60s show. He, he's and just so cute. He's so cute. He's real cute. He and Christina Ricci have like the most amazing chemistry. Yeah. I love it. Like they're they're playing off of each other in an amazing way. Like this is the thing where the straight man never gets the credit that they deserve. But like in that relationship, Pugsley is the straight man. Yeah. Wednesday's the funny one and he's the straight man. Yeah. And that takes talent. Yeah. And I am just so impressed by him. No, he's really, really cute. And um, Christopher Lloyd as Uncle Fester. Is he though? Well, we don't know. Mm. I mean... Yes, he is. We probably should talk about the plot for a second. Okay, go ahead. Because the plot in every single version is different because what are you going to do when you have to adapt a comic strip? Like, you got to make shit up. You got to make a plot, yeah. Yep, so the plot of this one is... Fester was lost 25 years ago in the Bermuda Triangle, and the family has always, uh, Gomez has always mourned his lost brother. And he's his brother in this, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so their lawyer uh, turns out Tully. <laughs> uh, Dan Hedaya, in, you were saying that when you think Dan Hedaya, you always think this, right? No, I think Cher's dad. Right, 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 right. Um, I always think. I always think the ship captain in Alien Resurrection. That's very random. It's just That's really it random. It's my favorite Dan Hedaya role. I love him in it. We thought we were watching He's this. He's so miscast, but he makes it work. We, I think we both had a watch of this where we were only watching Dan Hedaya. And I was like, do you think he gets to do a sword fight in any other movie? And no. you were like, no, absolutely no. not. No, Dan Hedaya owns this. He's so good. He's so funny. So he's the family's lawyer, and he's kind of up to no good. Turns out he owes a lot of money to this loan shark. Um, her name is Abigail Craven. Um, and she has this grown son. Who's weird. Gordon. Gordon. <laughs> and he meets Gordon, and Gordon's this tough guy who's got really pale skin and black around his eyes. But he's got a full head of curly hair. Kind of looks like maybe lost Fester. And he goes, you look exactly like Fester. I have a plan. The Adams family has a ton of gold. You're going to pretend to be Fester. And I guarantee I'll get you the money that I owe you. Because he owes them a ton of money. I'm not sure I could have explained that plot line particularly at all despite having seen this movie approximately four billion times that's the it plot. doesn't really matter no, yeah. but it, like but that's the plot that's the plot but i think it matters for one specific thing which is actually the biggest problem i have with the movie is that i don't like how ambiguous it is at the end whether gordon is actually fester or not yeah and it seems to be like it is, seems clear that he is fester yeah especially in the second movie like he's definitely yeah. fester but there's like a throwaway line where it's like yeah he did you were lost in the Bermuda Triangle and you washed up on shore and she found you and you had lost your memory and she raised you as her own I found out a story from Barry Sonnenfeld okay apparently his whole thing was that his original intention was that it was always going to be completely unclear whether fester really was an imposter or not gotcha but all the actors rebelled and of the cast, who do you think they sent to plead their case to Barry Sonnenfeld? Raul Julia. Should... Nope. Who? Christina Ricci. <laughs> they sent adorable Christina, 10-year-old Christina Ricci to him and said, 
she gave, apparently gave the, this is a quote from him gave this really impassioned plea that Fester shouldn't be an imposter so we ended up totally changing that plot point to make the actors happy and they were right it was the better way to go that's cute and I was so delighted to hear this because this was always my biggest problem with the movie that it was at all ambiguous yeah and I'm so happy to find out that it like was saved from being truly ambiguous yes because I want him to be Fester that's cute it's actually my and the reason it's my biggest problem with the movie is is that to me watching an Adams family story part of the joy of it is they're the Adams family it's who they are but what you're giving me is a version of the story where one of the main characters is spending the movie not actually as their character sure there's this whole thing of they're faking it right which I think is fine and I don't fault them for coming up with that as a plot and it does work but it's never going to be my favorite version of the story because I want to watch an Adams Family movie to see all of the Adams Family being the Adams Family. Right. And that's, well, that's, that's my a, only knock against it. It's true which is partly why I think Adams Family Values is almost a superior movie mm-hmm. because they are the fan and Fester is Fester in that movie he's just sort of led astray but there's never any question that he's Fester yeah what are before we move on what are some like other points about the movie what 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 is it about the movie that makes it so good to you like I clearly the casting is amazing I feel like we're going to talk more about Raul Julia and Angelica Houston like even in the sequel yeah uh for sure I mean the the two of them have the most intense chemistry of Mm -hmm. like almost any two actors I've ever seen like Raul Julia I mean he has chemistry with all with everyone I feel like he's really the glue that holds the whole thing together like he's so believable as the father of this family he has chemistry with the children like as their father he has chemistry with Fester as his brother oh my god he has deep sexual chemistry with Morticia um the scene where they do um, the mamushka has this like it is really interesting that they have this weird cast of characters that is the extended family right that they all mm-hmm. come to celebrate this event and it's like the movie freaks like it's like a sideshow which is intentional but I never it is so loving I never felt that any of these weird people were being making being made fun of no cousin it is like portrayed as like a sexy, interesting person that Tully's wife leaves him for. Cousin it, by the way, for people that don't remember, is the hairy one. The, hair, the short, a... tiny, hairy one yeah. um, who has no face. He's just hair. Like, Tully's wife leaves him, uh, portrayed by Dana Ivey, and it's not a joke. It's, it's like, really, sin- she's so sincere in her attraction to this weird circus freak well because he listens to her and he yeah. has interesting things to say a- but but also he's attracted like she finds him physically attractive yeah um and the the scene where they're doing the um the mamushka which is like the adams family dance i encourage you to watch that scene and watch the backup dancers because every one of them is very strange and they are having the best time mm-hmm. like it is it is shot with love. It is acted with love. Everyone's having fun. I have to believe that the atmosphere on that set was really positive because I don't know how they could have gotten that sort of joy out of background actors if it if it wasn't. I mean, I feel like from everything I'm hearing, the production was actually really hard. Yeah. But I think everyone believed in it. Yeah. Like, I think this movie is a perfect example of getting all the pieces together. Like, you, they got all the right pieces. Yeah. Everything is right. They got the, the right designer, the right costumer, the right actors. The music is incredible. Mark Shaman's score is amazing. Oh, in yeah. This. They got all the right people. Barry Sonnenfeld, I think, was absolutely the right director for it. I, I've uh, criticized on on this show before I've criticized Steven Spielberg specifically for trying to do like a live action cartoon mm-hmm. and never really getting the pace or the physics right. Yeah. Barry Sonnenfeld is he's the one who gets it right. Yeah. This feels like a cartoon. Yeah. In the best ways. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to you just mentioned Mark Shaman and it's funny like the part where they're sort of being cast out from their home because um, the, oh, whole, the yeah. whole thing is that like Fester kind of takes over the house um gordon gordon yeah uh and and kicks them out and they have to go live in live amongst normies for a little while By the way, i always remember this section of the movie being like an hour yeah when i was a kid not, it's, it's like, like the, 10 minutes it's 10 minutes it's the very end too um and like the score in that moment we turned to each other when we were like this has to have been inspired by anna tevka from it has the, to be has to have been and we were like yeah, Mark Shaman did the score. Of course, he's inspired by Anatevka. And then we realized in Adam's Family Values, they literally play Sunrise Sunset at the wedding. <laughs> so we were like, oh, of course. 
It's but it's all also the right... we cannot get through an episode without mentioning Fiddler on the Roof. No, we never. will do Fiddler on the Roof eventually. Well, there's going to be a new one coming out. I know when that. the new one comes out, we'll do Fiddler well, on the Roof. Well, it may not now. We don't It'll know. It'll come out eventually. All right. Um so all the right pieces. I don't think the execution is 100%. Yeah. They, they had lots of problems. I think it is it's clear that there were that there was troubles. Um I don't think the movie is perfect. Yeah. I think all the pieces are perfect, but I don't think it comes together 100%. Yeah, I mean it's kind of a Deus Ex Machina at the end about like, oh yeah, of course he was fester all along. Yeah, like I I just I think there are some weaknesses, some yeah. very very clear weaknesses. Fester isn't really fester the entire time. I don't really love his mom as the as the heavy in it. I don't think she's a great antagonist. I think, I think she's, she's I, I think she's I like good. Her. I think she's good. I like her. I I like her too. I just don't yeah. think she's great. But anyway, this movie came out and it was a hit. Yeah. It was a big hit. And it led to what I would say is the second best adaptation of the Adams Family ever made. Adams Family Values. Which is the 1992 Adams Family pinball game. It is goddamn fucking amazing. It is the best selling pinball machine of all time. They had it at our wedding venue and I never played it. I really wanted to and it just never happened. I have played th- th- this pinball machine, this pinball game and another one called Attack from Mars are the two that I have played more times in my life than any other. The game is incredible. The mechanic is amazing. Thing is in the game. Like you can literally open his box and a hand comes out and gives you another ball. Great. It is it's so good. The music is so good. All of the like sound effects from the movie are in it. It is my favorite pinball game of all time, I just want to say for posterity, designed by Pat Lawler and Larry DeMar and manufactured by WMS Industries. It is so fucking good. I feel like we just set like a podcast record of the, being the first podcast ever to give a design credit to a pinball game. And they deserve it because they did a great fucking job. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Then there was another one immediately after. Another pinball game? No, another cartoon. They did another adaptation as a cartoon. Okay. So there was the Adams Family, the 1992 to 1993 cartoon. I couldn't, I could find like clips from it, but I could not find it anywhere. Uh, the only thing of note, uh, here's a couple things really quickly. One, the character designs kind of harken back to the original Charles Adams comic. Um, maybe even more so than the old cartoon did. Uh, John and Sh- and not Sean Astin, John Astin returned as Gomez. Gotcha. But it was all new people. Like I think Rip Taylor played Fester. Which I think is delightful casting, because mm-hmm. Rip Taylor is, as we all know, a delightful person. Do you know Rip Taylor, right? No. I'll show you Rip Taylor later. Great. I'll link to some Rip Taylor. He's great. A couple of people know who I'm talking about. He's real fun. Uh, then, I'm so sorry, then 1993 hits. And of course, Adam's Family was a hit, so they want to make another one. So they make Adam's Family Values. Yes. A couple little notes about it. Barry Sonnenfeld returns, this time with a real goddamn committed cinematographer. And a cameo. Uh, well, he's in all of his movies. Yeah. He's in the first one, too. Who is he in the first one? He's the little guy in, in Gomez's train. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And well, in, this is a bigger cameo. A much bigger cameo. I remember him a lot more. For those that have seen the movie, he plays uh, Joel Glicker's dad. Um, he's got a couple of fantastic scenes when they drop Joel off and then when the play happens later in the movie. Uh, so he had a real cinematographer so he could focus on directing. He had, I think, a better script. So Paul Rudnick is someone that I brought up to you because I only had heard of him as a screenwriter. Mm-hmm. But like when I say Paul Rudnick to you, what do you, what do you think I of? said, oh, I believe he wrote a play called I Hate Hamlet, which is true. Yes. yes. So he's, he's written lots of theater. Um, he has, he's, he, I'm going to give you three different groups of things, things he was uncredited on, things he, he was credited as someone else on and things he was credited as himself on. Mm-hmm. So he was uncredited a rewriter on the first wives club Yep. and Adam, and the Adams family. Mm-hmm. He was a rewriter on that. Gotcha. Um, so actually I'm going to give him credit for most of the jokes that work in the first one. He was credited as Joseph Howard for his script for sister act. Wow. Because okay. he worked on it when it was originally going to be a vehicle a vehicle for Bette Midler. Okay. And then it underwent tons of rewrites and he was so dissatisfied with the final product. Not because from what I could tell that it was bad, but because he was like, well, that's not my script. Yeah. So I want your money, but you're going to credit me as someone else because okay. I don't want my name on it. But then he also is credited for um, uh, Adam's Family Values, In and Out, and okay. the Stepford Wives, Wives remake. Great. So I want to do the Stepford Wives for the show. I know. Point. I do too. Yeah. So Paul Rudnick, I, I want to give him a lot of credit because the script for this is fucking fantastic. It's very good. It is so goddamn funny. And the first one is also funny, but this one is better. Mm-hmm. So, okay. We kind of said it. Yeah. I want to be clear about it, if it's okay with you. Okay. 
I think this is one of the most improved sequels of all time. <laughs> like the first one is so good. Yeah. And this one I think improves in every single measurable way. It's the Godfather 2 of Adam's Family movies. It really is. Yeah. It really is. And Adam's Family Reunion is the Godfather 3 of Adam's it may, Family It movies. may well be. It may well, uh, And the Home Alone 2. I mean, Home Alone 2, I would argue, could be... Uh, but there's an argument to be made it's better than the first one. Um, The first one doesn't have Donald Trump in it. That's true. We could just cut that scene out, though. It's just a cameo. I think they have. I think, like, Canadian TV, I was reading, <laughs> cut out the Donald Trump scene. That's great. Like, for running time and people wanted to make it political. That's Whatever. Right. Whatever. Doesn't matter. This movie is better in every single way. So, like, here are some changes that it makes. Um, So, like, Dan Hedaya, uh, like, uh, you know, Gordon's mom, they're not in this one because they die at the end of the first one. Right. We're given to understand. We, they, they, may, they may have died. They may have been buried alive. Yeah. They're definitely dead. The question is, were they <laughs> dead before they went in the graves Gross. and got buried? Um, I think this movie does make um, a really good improvement by recasting Grandmama. Oh, yeah. Because in, let me just uh, make sure I've got this. In the first one, she is played by, and we didn't even talk about the entire cast. We got through about half of them. In the original, she's played by Judith Molina, mm -hmm. who I think does a good job. This is one of my favorite stories from the first one. According to Angelica Houston, actress Judith Molina's way of enduring being, quote, embedded in latex for over 12 hours a day was to smoke an endless series of joints in her trailer throughout filming. Great. Which I think is just a delightful story. <laughs> Uh, just a couple other people I want to mention really quickly. So uh, you mentioned Christopher Lloyd as Fester. Yeah. Uh, I'll get back to him in a second. Carol Stricken, uh, or Stryken, I'm not sure, as Lurch. Yeah. Who, interestingly enough, is deaf. He is deaf. Uh, he's very tall. Mm -hmm. And it was also in Men in Black. And Star Trek The Next Generation. Yes, he was. Yes. This is also true. A uh, Thing was played by a guy named Christopher Hart. Just his hand. Just his hand. Apparently he's a magician. That's so great. he did that. The only other thing that I think is just amazing about him is he also played the disembodied hand in Idle Hands. So the guy's got, like, he's good he's at something. He's got a thing. He's, he's got a He's, he's good got at something. Uh, and just in a little cameo, the Girl Scout in the first one, Mercedes McNabb from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Right, of course. Well, yeah. Right. We she, I mean, she's got a huge part in the second movie. I know, but yeah. I wanted to mention her cameo because gotcha. it's worth mentioning. I don't want, this is for posterity. Oh, I don't I'm want, sorry. I don't want to lose track of this stuff. So getting to the improvements they made, Grandmama was recast in Adam's Family Values, and I think this was absolutely trading up because they traded her for Carol Kane. Yes. Who is incredible. She's great. I don't know if this is the... It's not the best line in the movie, but I think it's her best line in the movie about uh, when they're talking to Wednesday and Pugsley, because now the, the whole plot of this one is they have a baby. They have the baby, Pubert. Well, it's like the subplot. There's like a main plot and a subplot. Pubert's the subplot. Is he? I think so. I think Debbie's the main plot. Right, but Debbie's only there because of the baby. So, like, I, it's all one it plot. Is, but I, honestly, I think it speaks to how much better the script is. Fair enough. I, I think it's so much stronger at this point. Fair but enough. But there's that scene where Wednesday and Pugsley, for the entire beginning of the movie, have been trying to kill Pubert, yes. the baby. And Angelica Houston, you know, Morticia says, like, do you think do you think that now that the baby's here, another child has to die? Yeah. And they go, yes. And what do they cut over to Grandma? And she says, well, that's not true. Not anymore. And it is Carol Kane's best line in the entire movie. It is so good. So that was trading up. But now, like, talk, talk about Debbie. Talk about trading up on a villain. Okay. So we have Joan Cusack as Debbie. She is a black widow. She finds rich men, marries them, kills them on their wedding night, and inherits all of their money. So she has set her sights on Fester. Fester Adams. Fester Adams, because he is rich and weird, and she's kind of weird. Like, that that's the thing that I like about her, is it's like, she's not weirded out by the Adamses and trying to hide it. Like, she's kind of into it, because she's kind of gross and dark, and uh, the part where Morticia is like, you have placed Fester under some sexual spell. I respect that. Like, yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. not that far apart. You, you know what I and mean? And I think that's the great, that's the great, like, I'm not even going to call it the tragedy of the movie, but like, Debbie would actually fit in. She would fit in. That's the thing. Like, like she would be a great Adams if she weren't evil. She's a little too evil to be an yeah. Adams. They don't murder if they kill you by accident, they'll feel bad. Right. But like, they don't murder. Like, like the stripper in Fester's wedding yes. cake. Yes. Yes. In his bachelor party cake. Yes. Which is, oh man, Gomez is so sad. That poor girl. For a second. Yeah. Hey. Say la vie. Say la vie. Um, so Debbie comes to the house in disguise as a nanny. 
to take care of the children and she realizes that uh, at least Wednesday if not Pugsley is on to her game and needs to get them out of the house so she sends them away to summer camp through intrigue um so they have to go to summer camp which I think the summer camp is kind of the subplot uh, it is, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, run by Christine Baranski and um, Peter McNichol. Peter McNichol, Gary Granger, and Becky Martin Granger. That's right. Because this was the time when like making fun of a hyphenate was like a funny thing. Yeah, and well, now we're just kind of over it. Yeah, well, she's a very annoying character. Well, yeah, and like the whole thing is they're not cheerful and good like you should be at summer camp and they have an antagonist in uh mercedes mcnab um, and also gary granger and becky martin granger right, who try to get them to be cheerful um and they meet they make a friend who's also not cheerful and it turns out there's a bunch of kids at this camp who are not cheerful so they're able to sabotage the uh end of camp thanksgiving play and uh take over the camp and i think this is one of my favorite parts of the movie especially when they drop the kids off at camp because it's this perfect example of like who the adams family are and who they were originally designed to comment on yeah because charles adams originally designed them to comment on the other types of people that are at this camp dropping off their privileged kids right like literally the camp is for privileged youth. right <laughs> that's the point and so they're interacting with all of these people who they have actually a ton in common with right they have so much in common with these other people they just happen to be very weird yeah and the other parents are like look at these weird people it's like no but they're pretty much the same as you yeah i mean you love the part where where the the annoying dad who's also on freaks and geeks who is like um yeah my kid did all these great things what about your boy and gomez just grabs pugsley with the proudest look in the world on his face and goes probation <laughs> and you just loved it because he's so proud of his son. Go, Raul Julia, is this when we do the quick? Can I do a quick sidebar on Raul Julia? Sure. Raul Julia's performance in a in two movies where everyone I think is giving career best performances. Yeah. Like everyone at some point in this movie is giving the best performance of the movie. Yeah. Raul Julia gives the best performance in either movies. Yes. Like I think he owns the character of Gomez in such a way that like. I'm not sure anyone else ever could play Gomez yeah. after this. Well, I mean, especially when you realize he was dying at the time, which yeah. is really sad. It's just an incredible performance. Yeah. He, there is a, a section of this movie. I, 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 There aren't many of these that exist, but it's like a perfect, perfect five seconds of cinema where you get like three payoffs to a joke all at once. But it's just like... For the people that know Adam's Family Values well, it's the scene where Wednesday and Pugsley drop Pubert off the roof and Fester goes over to the window because he's talking about the weather with Morticia and he puts his arms out and Pubert drops into his arms and they've also dropped a bowling ball to see which hits the, the ground first. And then in the head, which is so funny. And like, it's this five seconds where Gomez turns around to Morticia with the baby and it's like three moments in rapid succession. <laughs> One, the look on Gomez's face when they turn around is... Amazing. Is a look for the ages. Of, of just abject horror. It doesn't really lend itself to podcast. But... No, but it's like abject, but it like it hits that perfect um, kind of cross point of cartoony and genuine. Like I believe the emotions he's feeling, yeah. but it's also like he's a human cartoon. Sure. Morticia looks and with no emotion just goes, oh dear. And then we cut to the bowling ball dropping on Lurch's head. Yeah. It is perfectly crafted and it's one of those things that wouldn't get a ton of attention any other way but like on this show i am making sure that it gets the attention that it deserves this is a great moment it is a perfect five seconds of film yes it's i believe amazing. you said the most perfect five seconds of film in any movie well i'll walk that back a little bit maybe top five that's fair i would say so I, I appreciate you letting me go on a little tangent there. Yeah. But I love Chippewa. I love the whole camp stuff because I think it gets to the stuff that Charles Adams was doing in the comic originally, mm -hmm. which is great. So they fuck up camp for everybody. Meanwhile, what does Debbie do with Fester? She marries him. She marries him and they play Sunrise Sunset at the wedding and it's the best part of the movie. <laughs> and then she tries to kill him on her wedding night and realizes like maybe he can't die. Well, he's Fester Adams. Right. She didn't account for that she in her plans. She did not account for that. And th so then she's like, all right, fuck it. I guess I'll just like spend all his money and try to kill him and I have to bone him sometimes. And the part where they're moving into the house and he's she's made him like change all his clothes and like wear a wig. And he's like, 
I'm her husband. You thought was so funny. But that's like the other part of the movie. It's like these perfect, they, they just layer jokes on top of each other. It's, yeah. I feel like any other movie would just do, we need a joke here and a joke here. But this is like, how can we put three jokes in a row? So I obviously I'm going to like, it's like dissecting the frog. Like the frog is dead at the end of it. Uh, yeah. And the joke's not funny anymore. But like the movers ask her where to put something. Fester just goes, I'm her husband. <laughs> And she, and she like tells him to shut up and then without missing a beat he goes uh give me a kiss and she goes give me a 20 and he immediately goes to his pockets to look for cash and he's so sad about Jeez. it but it's like th- they have to have like three jokes in a row in yeah. rapid succession it's like perfectly crafted it's so good the tone is so good so uh, we have this great villain we have great i just want to name really quickly before we finish this one up the cast is great but we also have great like bit players in it mm-hmm. uh Okay, David Hyde Pierce as the doctor at the beginning that delivers pubert. He's great. He's so good. It's like he's barely in it. One scene. Peter Graves is doing the like unsolved mysteries where you learn about Debbie the Black Widow. Yeah. He's great. That was pretty funny. Uh, Cynthia Nixon plays one of the like potential nannies that they're going to get. Yeah, I mean, you pointed out this came out the same year as Mrs. Doubtfire. So like you could have like a bad nanny double feature. Like that's actually a question that I have. Like who is who is more destructive? Like Debbie or Mrs. Doubtfire? Because Mrs. Doubtfire is like, what he did is pretty fucked up. Like, it's yeah, pretty it's, bad. It's pretty bad. Like, he should not have the trust of his family ever again after what happened. Yeah. But at least Debbie was a little more upfront about her craziness. It's fair. I, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, Tony Shalhoub is in a great little cameo. Oh, yeah. Like, as the sailor in the bar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it does have a fantastic cameo of Nathan Lane as the police desk sergeant. That's so good. And not only is Nathan Lane amazing in the scene, but it's Raul Julia's best scene in the entire movie because the, <laughs> like, this is where they've gone to go visit Fester and like Debbie won't even let them see him. Yeah. And so he goes to the police to say, like, you must, you must stop this woman. This is like the only thing, like these are one of the only points in the movie where it seems like they actually are kind of mean spirited towards people who are quote unquote normal. Yeah. 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 But she's also kind of ostentatious and that seems to be what they're against. Right. And Nathan Lane being here is important for, you know, two reasons. One, he's great. Yeah. What's another reason that it's important? Uh, He would years later would play Gomez in the musical. Yeah. The Adams Family. Which we are going to talk about. Which we will about. come to talk about. So do you want to wrap the movie up? Wrap up Adams Family Values? I mean, what more can be said? It's so good. Perhaps even better than the first one. I would Definitely recommend. Definitely better than the first one. Anyone watch it right now. It is like, and I feel like this is the best thing I can say about it. The first one is fantastic. And Adams Family Values manages to be even better. Yeah. And one last thing I will throw in, uh, just to prove that life isn't fair, Adam's Family Values, way better reviewed than the first one. Made way less money. Oh. So. What a terrible shame. Life isn't fair. And I'll tell you another reason that that, that life isn't fair. Mm-hmm. They didn't stop making Adam's Family stuff after this movie came out. You're familiar with the phrase, quit while you're ahead? Oh, they were so far ahead. They did not They do that. Things just get bad from here on out. Yeah. And... I don't know how fast you want to blow through everything, but I feel like we need to give this some time. Okay. Um, there was a third Adam. Little known fact. There was a third Adams Family movie from the 90s. Yeah. So it was five years later yeah. in 1998. Can I give a quick little preamble? Sure. Because Adams Family Values didn't do well, Paramount didn't want to make any more of these movies, which like from a creative standpoint and from a you know, from someone who loves the movie, like that's fucking bullshit. But from a financial standpoint, I don't really blame them. Mm-hmm. Then uh, a company called Saban got the rights. Saban of <laughs> Mighty Morphin Power Rangers fame. Great. You know, kids stuff. Mm-hmm. They make stuff for kids. Stuff for kids. They got the rights. Yeah. And apparently they could. They wanted to go in a lot of different directions. One of the things that they wanted to do was they wanted to make a TV movie and then use that to be a pilot for something. Yeah. But then at the same time, they were also developing another TV show. So that I'm not 100% clear on how the next two Adams families, like, relate to each other. Mm-hmm. But they came out basically at the same time and are both produced by Saban. Sure, sure, sure. The first one that we got was Adam's Family Reunion in 1998. Yes. Starring almost no one from the first two Adam's Family films. Really one and a half people <laughs> from the movies ended up being in this one. Uh so Thing yep. is the same hand. Yep. And Lurch is the same. Lurch is the same. Mm-hmm. Um Gomez is recast as Tim Curry, and Morticia is recast as Daryl Hannah. Mm-hmm. Two people with 
You know how we said that like Gomez had chemistry with everyone, particularly Morticia? Raul Julia. Raul specifically, Julia yeah. specifically. Two people with less chemistry, like sexual chemistry, than Tim Curry and Daryl Hannah, I fear you would be hard to come by. You could not find You could them. not find two people. Like it's almost like a magnetic poles repulsing each other. So little chemistry have they as this romantic couple. It it really is a shame that you have Okay, so I'm just this movie's fucking terrible. It's so bad. The plot is incomprehensible. It is and the acting uh, is abysmal. It's it was a waste of everyone's time. But I look at some you know, I look at Tim Curry and I look at Daryl Hannah and this is saying this movie's not very good, I don't feel is very mean because like I, I <laughs> I think even the people that made it knew it wasn't very good. It was yeah. directed by a guy named Dave Payne who came up through the ranks of like Roger Corman um, doing like lots of really quick low budget movies. And he was waiting for his break. And so he was like, Adam's family. I love it. I can make this good. He he said that he looked back and he was like, I wanted to I wanted to like have my Coen brothers moment and make something really, really good. Um, and he basically said at every single step of the way, Saban scuttled any desire or any plans that he and the writers had to make it good. Oh. And every single time he was like, Saban told us that we couldn't do that. And so it's bad because of them, which like, I mean, that's convenient. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I believe him to a point. Yeah. But also... I, I I wonder, I assume the director bears some responsibility for this. One would think. But even he agreed at the end of the day that it wasn't good. So I feel like dunking on the movie is not the worst thing in the world. Uh-huh. I'm about to do some dunking that actually does make me feel a little bad. Yeah. Daryl Hannah is a pretty terrible actor. Yeah. She's not good. Uh-huh. I, I can tell you that the number of movies that I have enjoyed Daryl Hannah in are two. Okay. Kill Bill Volume 1. Didn't see it. And Kill Bill Volume 2. Didn't see it. She's fucking incredible I'm in not it. sure I could name a movie I've seen with Daryl Hannah in it. You never saw Splash? No. She's okay. Okay. Yeah. She's all right. But then you have someone like Tim Curry. Who we love. Who is just a magnetic talent. The likes that many... He has, he has risen to heights of charismatic acting that many people would aspire to and never reach. Yes. And yet he is terrible in this. I, I got the feeling, and I never really have thought this about Tim Curry, but I, I think it tracks that I think Tim Curry needs a director to rein him in. Mm-hmm. Um, because he was over the top bananas in this Crazy and also town banana pants. yeah and also like had didn't have a lot to work with because as i said like his chemistry with daryl hannah was very like like literally half of gomez's character is how intensely in love he is with his wife and how much he wants to bone her all the time and the, it was not good the tone of this movie and I, I think this segues into it nicely the tone of this movie is wild like Everyone is dialed to about a 15 out of 10. Yeah. If not like a 20 out of 10 at all times. Like there's just so much screeching and screaming and like big, wide, crazy eyes. And like the all the women are insane. Yeah. Um, By contrast, in Adam's Family and Adam's Family Values, yeah. in the two movies, everyone's dialed up to a 10. Yeah. But that's where the dial stops. Yes. That's still on the scale. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. But you don't go beyond that. Yeah. Don't go to 15. Uh, it's too many. Yeah. And and it's this was the first of a couple of different versions where someone decided that Pugsley's only defining characteristic is that he's fat, which is shitty in a number of ways, not least of which because he's a child. Yeah. Um, but also, like, because as you pointed out in the other two movies from the 90s, he's a really good straight man for Wednesday. Yeah. Um, but if he's nothing, that's not the same thing as being a good straight man. Can I talk about the plot for a second? Sure, but I think it's going to be either complex or nothing no i can do this quick okay because like i said if you're going to do the adams family you got to come up with your own plot because you're not going to look at the source material for a plot the adams family are at their estate which for some reason is in the desert and not the suburbs which is bullshit also they kill male men all the time yeah postal workers do not survive coming to this house that's what we learned from the first 15 minutes of this movie so long we spent with that mailman <laughs> and he is having a rough time of it before any of the adamses even show up and we get gomez and it's terrible uh they're all at their house and they're all doing their adams thing and then suddenly great grandfather mortimer adams and great grandmother delilah adams show up played by kevin mccarthy 
like fucking royalty Kevin McCarthy of Invasion of the Body Snatchers and UHF and other things. Estelle Harris, his wife, Estelle Harris, fuck it, George Costanza's mother shows up. Mm -hmm. And they are Adamses. But the thing that we are given to understand is that in their old age, they're actually becoming normal. And this uh, vexes the this vexes Gomez yes. greatly, and he is not okay with the fact that they are becoming normal. So their big plan is that they are going to find out why this is happening. Also, at the same time, there is a travel agency near them that is arranging all of the travel for people going to the Adams family reunion. Mm -hmm. Adams with one D. With one D. It, they're normies. Yes. Just a bunch of normies named Adams. How do you pronounce Adams rather than Adams? Adams. 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 Right? They get their invitation and they go, we had no idea we were even, we don't know any of these people, but we must be dis distant cousins. They must be inviting us for a reason. Too bad they spell their name wrong, but yeah. I'm sure it's fine. Here's the deal. Let's go to the reunion and when we go, we can find some help to figure out what's going on with these two old people. Here's the thing. I don't understand why the whole great-grandmother and great-grandfather plot is even necessary. It becomes nothing. Like, it just disappears after a certain point. Like, Utterly it, gone. Like, they're looking for a doctor, and then Ed Begley Jr. is there, and he is a doctor. But He's like, one of the Adamses. Yeah, but, like, the two things never really connect in any meaningful way. It's very strange. Like, they could have just been the Adams family getting invited to a family reunion. Yeah. I don't understand why there has to be a plot. Yeah. There doesn't have to be something like that. Um, because like at its essence, I'm not against that as a plot. I think that's funny because the whole point of the Adams family, a lot of the comedy comes from what happens when these weirdos meet regular weirdos. Yes. And that's what we could have had, but that's not what we got. Yeah. So that's the plot. And they go to the reunion kind of assuming that they are part of this family, but also lying about who they are like gomez starts putting on an accent for the entire time that they're with these people or maybe he had one to begin with and he just wasn't doing it it's very unclear it's super unclear but he, he they basically make enemies of ed bagley jr uh because there's his wife there's like another subplot where there's a patriarch of the regular adams family yeah. that's going to give a lot of money to his three kids and they one of the kids and his wife end up going to the Adams family mansion by accident. It's yeah. like a whole switcheroo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's yeah. a subplot where they're going to like... With Grandmama. Grandmama's there. still there. And it like, to be clear, nothing that we're talking about works. Like, usually in something like this, I can find something that I enjoy. Anything. Yeah. And I found nothing. And there's like a graveyard at the hotel that they're trying to dig up the graves. And Pugsley m meets a girl that he likes who's supposed to sort of be his cousin but not really well they kind of ape that i feel like they ape the thing from adam's family values where wednesday finds like a nerdy kid yeah and because they're both outcasts that brings them together right and then they just use the exact same thing in this one yeah. like it's literally the same plot and except she has no personality yeah whereas david crumholtz had That's great. so much personality. And then Fester has a dog that he's trained to eat hair. And like the dog morphs from a little white dog into a CG like a, dog. A gremlin. But to be clear, a 1998 TV CG dog. Yeah, it looks like a gremlin. It looks terrible. Yeah. No, the gremlins looked good. All right. This looks very bad. Okay. But and what did you say what it eats? Hair. Hair. For some reason. This is just this is this is these are the jokes so they came up with. So then it's like attacking with. ladies in the bathroom because they're like brushing their hair. And yeah. then the one woman that's super mean, she's the mother of a kid and she's. <laughs> I actually have a quote from you. Okay. I, I hate this thing with the hair and the dog. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there it is. Um. So anyway, yeah, I don't really want to spend too much time on it. The, the actress that plays Wednesday, you like. Like, the way they have her made up, they were, like, sort of zooming around the table to see all the different Adamses, and you were like, ugh, it's like a 20-year-old, like, it's just short adult, and you looked her up, and she's 12. Yeah. She's just got a lot of makeup on, so, like, she looks kind of weird, and she is not a good actor. She's, like, she's, like, not even, like, the poor man's Christina Ricci. She's, like, the poor man's Firuza Balk. That's me. Firuza Balk's fantastic. No, I'm saying she's the poor man's version. Yeah, but you're implying that Firuza Balk is lesser than Christina Ricci. She's not as big a star as Christina Ricci. Yeah, but their talent is... I I'm not talking about talent. I'm talking about, like, get me a sort of someone who's kind of like Christina Ricci. Yeah, get me a Christina Ricci type. We don't have the money for it. Get me a Firuza Balk type. Yes. That's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Yes, yes. No, no insult against Firuza Balk meant... Um, if anyone has ever been a 12-year-old girl, uh, I assume you also watched The Craft at every sleepover. So just to be clear, yeah. you have seen Return to Oz, 
and won't watch it again, or you've never seen it and won't watch it? I saw it when I was five. Which is too young. It gave me nightmares, according to my mom. Um, she would not let me watch it again. Therefore, I have not seen it again. Okay. Because it's very, very good. Yes. Just to be clear. Yes. Fruza Balk, I got no problem with Fruza Balk. But anyway, you were saying about the actress that plays Wednesday. She's not good. She's very bad. Yeah. But clearly the producers really liked her because they cast her again in the TV show. She's the only cast member that makes it from this to the TV show. And her acting is terrible. And I don't understand. Is this... What do we name a segment where we dunk on kids? I, I don't know. I feel bad. Like, That's I don't feel good is. about it. I don't feel... Welcome to I Don't Feel Good <laughs> About It, when uh, Jeremy Latour and Ariel Lipshaw dunk on child actors who are guilty of nothing other than being a kid and wanting to be in a movie, Yeah, which is fine and understandable, and I applaud them, and she showed up, and it is not her fault that she wasn't a great actor at 12. No, I, I'm just saying... But anyway, I, but I agree with you Moving to be on. clear. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, I just want to say one more thing about this. And I feel like this is the biggest problem. And we didn't talk about it because like, it, it was the thing that I think set us against it. I want to be careful when I say this because I don't want to say they get the characters wrong because it's hard to say that when you're basing all of these characters on a comic strip. There is no right or wrong. This was this goes back to something I said at the very beginning, which is like the Adams family is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And I found reviews of this one from people who were like, I grew up on this one. The movies were not good, but like this one's fantastic, which like, yes, I roll my eyes about that, too. But it doesn't change the fact that like because there are so many different versions of the Adams family, one of them is going to be the canonical version for somebody. I guess. And so I don't want to say this one gets it wrong. How can I say that it gets it wrong in a way that is acknowledging that? I mean, you can say it is fairly objectively a really bad movie. No, it is a really bad movie. But here's what I'm trying to say. The Adams family are not enjoyable to watch for 90 minutes. Yes. Because they are incredibly mean spirited. Yeah. And that's my biggest problem with it. And I don't want to say that like them being not mean spirited is canonical. It just, that is what I value the most in an Adams Family story. Yeah. And that's something that the two movies got, the two original movies got perfectly. It's something that the original TV show got perfectly. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think is even in the comic strip yeah. to a certain extent. Sure. They're not evil people. They don't relish in harm befalling others. Occasionally they do, but yeah. not like as a rule. Yeah. And in this one, the Adamses are bloodthirsty. <laughs> like when when bad stuff happens to other people, they delight in it. Yeah. And Gomez is a he's an he's a fucking asshole. Yeah. He's really really mean. And I didn't want to watch them for ninety minutes. I didn't give a fuck what happened to them because I hated them. Yeah. And I don't want to hate the Adams family. I love the Adams family. Yeah, that's they're fair. creepy and they're kooky, mysterious and spooky. Like I love them. Yeah. I love them, and this made me hate them. And that was why I hated Adams Family Reunion, nineteen ninety eight. Well, I think let's just leave it at that. Moving on. Moving on to something that I think we're going to disagree on. At the same time, a TV show was being produced by Saban uh, called The New Adams Family. It was produced in uh, Vancouver, and it aired on, like, Fox Kids or something like that. Mm -hmm. It is a kids show. Yes. Like, let's be clear. This is a show for children. Yes. Like, I assume it was shown, like, on Saturday mornings or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It stars uh, Glenn Taranto as Gomez. Yes. Um, it stars Ellie Harvey as Morticia, mm -hmm. Nicole Fugere, who we just mentioned, yes. as Wednesday, uh, Brody Smith as Pugs Pugsley, and then a whole bunch of cool guest stars. Like in the very first episode, Jerry Van Dyke shows up yeah. and like kind of weirdly elevates the material because he's <laughs> Jerry Van Dyke and he's a goddamn professional. He's been doing this for years. Yeah. And then we have Grandpapa Adams uh -huh. who shows up, who is played by John Aston. And is he delightful? He is delightful. I mean, even more so in the fact that, what is his name? Glenn, Glenn Taranto? Taranto, yeah. So or Taranto, like, I'm not Tim sure. Curry is doing like a Raul Julia impression but yeah. glenn taranto is doing a john aston impression like yes. he looks they are similar in appearance he's doing like well no like glenn taranto has a round like a traditional round head yeah but he doesn't like, have a triangle this his smile is like some is really similar he's, like, he's doing an impression he's doing an impression and so when john aston shows up it, it's actually very cute yeah because they look really similar like this is the thing i think we're going to differ on i i think we both agree that it's not a very good show. Yeah. I kind of liked it, though. I know that you did. I didn't enjoy watching it. I did not think it was very fun. Also, just side note, 
um, they did not get the rights to the Adams Family song. No, yeah, the theme song is terrible. Yeah, like literally in the theme song, there's like occasional snapping, but then at the end of the theme song, and it's in every single episode, all of the Adams Family are there, and they all do snap, snap. But in the song, the lyrics, the last lyrics of the song are snap, snap, which is fucking stupid. Yeah. If you can't get the rights to the theme song, just make up a brand new theme song. (laughs) It's totally fine. Do a new thing. It's okay. Don't just do something kind of similar and hope people won't notice. It is a a bad theme song. And this is coming from someone who has already gone on record to say that I think the original theme song is problematic at best. Yeah. Um, I guess here's the problem that I had. If what you value in an Adams Family adaptation is that they are like good hearted people that are kind of confused about why everyone doesn't want to be their friends, like they they hit the mark. Like they do they do that thing. Yep. The thing Gomez and Morticia love each other they so do. much. They do love each other a lot. Um that's fair enough as well. I don't think the child acting is particularly good. I agree with you. Um the other thing that just struck me is like they are the Adams family. They enjoy dark and depressing things, yeah. whereas most people would enjoy l- light and happy things. Mm-hmm. But it's not like Gomez is the type of guy who would be proud of uh, proud of his son for being on probation. Yes, but it's not opposite day. And sometimes I felt like they weren't exploring what an Adams would be interested so much as just doing opposite day. Yeah. So like. Um, I know the scene you're thinking about, too. So, like, Wednesday and Pugsley say, we're going out to play. And Morticia says, okay, have fun. Uh, forget to put your jackets on. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't make any sense. I completely agree that with you. That doesn't make any sense. Like I said, I don't think the show's good. Yeah. I think, like, I think this is one of those situations where we really agree about the, like, objective truth of the show. Yeah. I just... I enjoyed it. That's fine. I enjoyed That's it. That's fine. <laughs> but, you but can you're enjoy right. it. But you're right. You are absolutely right. No, the, the scene that I was thinking of is the one where they're all outside for a picnic. Mm-hmm. And it's a picnic at night in yeah. the moonlight. And they're all talking about getting like moon rays or instead of getting some sun. Right. And it's, again, like, as you say, it's not opposite land. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like let me give you an example of how, like, how this was handled beautifully in... Adam's Family Values, right? Um, which I think I've already quoted this scene now twice. Um, so it's like, it's not so much opposite as the Adamses have certain interests that are different from other normal people's interests. Mm-hmm. So uh, Roll Julia and uh, Angelica Houston are sitting in the graveyard at night and they can hear the three children like going crazy and like breaking stuff and all this. And Roll Julia says to her, I just I just worry about you, Morticia. You know, all this stress, like like it's not it's not good for you. And she says, oh, Gomez, you don't worry about me. I'm just like any modern woman trying to have it all. A loving husband, a family. I just wish I had more time to seek out the dark forces and join their hellish crusade. And it's an amazing line. Um, but that's how you subvert an expectation, right? Of, of something that a mother would want. More time. More time to do what? To seek out the dark forces and join their hellish crusade, of course. Like she wants to pursue her interests. Yeah, exactly. That's something anyone can identify with. But in this show, I feel like she would say something like, I just wish I had less time. You know, yes. like just the opposite of what you would expect Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah i think the writing is and like i think the writing is pretty poor even for a kid's show and i think it really i think it uses the fact that it's a kid's show as an excuse for the tone in the writing Mm -hmm. because the tone is fucking batshit yeah it is a manic goddamn show the camera's constantly moving it's constantly cutting everything's loud there's so many sound effects it's I just feel like it's a children's television show made by people who don't understand children's television yeah, and are doing it because they couldn't find better work, which is maybe the shittiest thing I've said this episode. Maybe. But like, it's poor. It is a poor show. Yeah. The thing that makes me like it is I do think there are people who care about the Adams Family, but it's really clear that they care about the original show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the leads really do. I actually think Gomez and Morticia are good Mm -hmm. are doing a good job sell me on the fact that they love each other okay and are positive people okay that's fair that and and that alone makes me kind of like it plus john astin showed up and that was kind of delightful yeah it is a deeply deeply flawed show and again they should have quit while they were ahead yes but that's the new adams family let's continue then we have to go forward like another decade Mm -hmm. and 
this is something that is super cool. Yeah. Because we got Nathan Lane, who we just talked about. Yeah. And now suddenly he gets a chance to be song and dance man playing Gomez on Broadway. Broadway. We've got The Addams Family, the 2010 musical. Music and lyrics by Andrew Lippa, book by Marshall Brickman and Rick Ellis. Uh, do, what do you, what do you know? You do you know these names? Yes. Okay. What do is there anything that you can say that they have done? Um. Do you know who Rick Ellis is? No. He's Roger Reese's husband. Oh, shut up. Yes. That poor guy. Um. Oh my God, I'm so sad now. Yeah. So I met Rick Ellis one time because I was interviewing to um be a production assistant, uh, an intern on a show at New York Theater Workshop that he was writing called Peter and the Starcatcher, and you've told me about this. It was. The most batshit interview I've ever had. I walked into a room with Rick Ellis. He didn't look at me. He didn't look me in the eye. I sat down at a table. He was way too good to be there. He said, tell me about yourself. I sat there and awkwardly told him about myself for 15 minutes. And then I stopped and I said, do you have any questions for me? And he said, no, I was just sitting here thinking about something else while you were talking. And I went, okay. And then he explained to me the duties of the position and basically it required they wanted someone for free for no pay to attend every single rehearsal um, on an equity rehearsal schedule and then go home every night, take Rick Ellis's writing notes and then uh, and changes to the script, then go home, enter them into the script and have them ready for the actors for rehearsal the next day. So they, they wanted a 12 hour work day for free and i thought that was terrible (laughs) and they also didn't offer me the job (laughs) but i wouldn't have taken it that was my experience but i did feel very bad because he did lose his husband yeah um but so do we can we dunk on this guy or should we not i mean like 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 50 50 right like he's bereaved but also um he was really mean to me (laughs) but also roger reese is wonderful and saw something in him i yeah i never understood that i never understood it like maybe he's a really nice guy and was having a bad day i don't know i mean let's assume so yeah i'd like to assume so that's fine but anyway he helped write this yes andrew lippa uh what about him uh he's he's written a bunch of musicals uh, he, did yeah. he write some of the songs for you're a good man charlie brown i think i saw yes. it read that when i was looking at yep that sounds doing right my, doing my research that sounds right so they made an adams family musical and you know what uh good like i think it, it kind of lends itself to musical theater i think it is a good fit for musical theater mm-hmm. i'm glad someone did it I'm not super excited that they did it the way they did it. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I don't think I'm the only person who felt that. I, Even though like it made a shitload of money and yeah. ran for like hundreds of like 700 performances I mean, or yeah, something and like it's that. like really popular in community theater now. Yeah. Um, high schools, a lot of high schools have been doing it. It was on the West End. It was on Broadway. I will say again, like our normal caveat for talking about musicals. Yeah. Like we saw this on a bootleg on YouTube. So, you know, not the optimal viewing experience no. but we thought it was better than not seeing it at all mm-hmm. um, but i don't think anything that we're judging is based on like assumptions we're making about it like i think anything we're talking about is stuff we can still objectively talk about yeah that's even fair. though as i said in, in matilda there wasn't too much of a chance that we were going to be transported by this viewing experience yeah so they've made a little bit of a change to the standard plot of the adams family which is that wednesday is a little bit older yeah and the gomez and morticia are a little bit older so like they have to come up with a plot yeah what is the plot that they come up with um so Wednesday is like 18 and she's fallen in love with this boy, this This, normie. This normie. And if you've seen the movie The Birdcage, that is the plot. (laughs) The the normie is bringing his parents and Wednesday is very concerned that her parents will not act normal around his normie parents. Why was it? And then then the parents are like, no, we should act normal. We're going to do our best to act normal. Yeah. And then it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. Why why did I think so much about the... Something about this made me think of The Birdcage constantly and I'm not sure what it was. I mean, I guess it's just like this... Oh, because Nathan Lane is in it. Oh, you're right. There it is. <laughs> was, there it is. I was trying to think, like, because the plot is the same. <laughs> like, okay. Do it... you think Nathan Lane at some point was like, this reminds me of the famous movie, The Birdcage, that I was in? Like, do you think he made that connection? I, when I think about Nathan Lane, I always feel like it's 50 50 that he remembers anything he's worked on. That's fair. Like, he's a goddamn working actor. Yeah. And he's been in a lot of stuff. I mean, Nathan Lane was in The Lion King. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I feel like he's the kind of person who, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but I feel like if you were to walk up to him and say, I loved you in The Lion King, he would have to be like, yeah, yeah. And you'd be like, you Hakuna were so, Matata? you were so good. And he says, oh yes, of course. No, that was so much fun. Yeah. I just feel like he's done so many things. He needs to be reminded. I like to think he needs to be reminded of all the things that he's done. Maybe so. Like, I wonder if it was after he was done with his full run that he was being interviewed for it saying like, so you're, you finished your year long run playing Gomez on Broadway. How, how fun was it for you to do this like, did you take any inspiration from Raul Julia because you were of course in Adam's Family Values and he's thinking you know what I was I was in Adam's Family Values yeah. I feel like I probably should have thought of that a year ago no. when I started doing this no probably I not I don't know why you get that impression I like I, it's not it's not it's, an impression it, it's a hope it's just funny it's uh, Nathan Lane is great and uh, I compare him as Gomez in this to Tim Curry in Adam's Family Reunion in in a more positive way for sure, Nathan sure, sure. Lane where like I think he showed up and he just naturally has a magnetism. Sort of an exuberance. Right? That I do think works more. Yeah. But I still think they made some mistakes. Sure. I, there are things that they did that I don't agree with. Sure, sure, sure. And at the end of the day, I think it is not a super successful show. I was not um, totally on board with his chemistry with B.B. Newworth. Um, yeah. That didn't really do it for me. I don't know your feelings on that. I like I don't know how much to blame them and how much to blame the writing because I really I just I just don't, I just don't think it's a good musical. I just don't think of Nathan Lane as someone with like a sexuality and I, yeah. I and BB Newworth is also kind of famous for playing like these really icy characters which made her a good choice for Morticia, I suppose, but like the 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 element where there's supposed to be this like sexual magnetism between them, I did I did not come across for no. me. But like we have to judge it you know, we have to judge it based on like what we saw with those two actors. Sure. But like based on the script and based on the songs, do you feel like the magnetism was there? No. Like, not, I, not really. I don't think it was. I don't think so either because she's like the her whole plot line is like she's like concerned about getting older. Yeah. And he's like trying to reassure her that like she's still very attractive to him. But like, I don't know, it comes across a little hollow. It, well, it comes across as hollow and it doesn't really feel like the Adams. That's, I think, one it doesn't of the really big feel things. like the Adams. It doesn't feel like the Adams family because her whole arc is. <sighs> Almost every song in this show, I feel like, could have been a song in another show. Yeah. Not all of them felt like they needed to be the Adams Family. Oh, I sure, sure, sure. I didn't feel like Morticia's arc, for example, was and was emblematic of Morticia Adams. Yeah. So, like you mentioned before, the the line that Angelica Houston has in the the cemetery in Adams Family Values with where out with uh, with Gomez, uh, where the thing she wants is what anyone would want in that situation yeah but then there's a twist that makes it morticia yeah this does the first part but almost never does the second part right like there was never that twist that made what morticia was going through emblematic of morticia yeah it just was what a anyone if you want to be... be stereotypical about any middle-aged woman who has you know kids and it feels like she's wasted her life I, I'm saying, like, if you're writing a show about that and you want to be stereotypical, yeah. you write the songs that they wrote for Morticia. Sure, sure, sure. I don't think they wrote anything special for her. Right. And there's this song that Gomez has with Wednesday that she's sort of asking him, like, are you upset that I want to go off and marry this boy? And it's the sweetest song in the world. Genuinely. For a dad to sing to his daughter about how it's like, how it's called happy sad it's yeah it's called happy sad and it's about how it's okay to be happy and sad at the same time mm -hmm. about about something i'm happy for you i'm sad for me but that doesn't make it bad but it's it's not an adam's family song it's a it's the sweetest song in the world it is so sweet and we saw a clip of um so roger reese took over from um nathan, nathan lane. lane and we were able to see a clip of Roger Rees singing this song. I like and, it in the show notes. And he sings it so sweetly um, and so sincerely. He's such a good actor. And he was dying um, when he's, he, I don't know if he, he, he died during the run of the show. He had to drop out because of his health. And oh, then he really? died. Yeah. Um, it's just this, like, I, I don't know how else to describe it other than like a very, very, very sweet, sincere, tender song for a dad to sing to his daughter. But it could have been in Fiddler on the Roof. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like, it could be any song. Super quick. I just want to do a quick sidebar. Yeah. Um, just in case anyone um, is listening to this that hasn't listened to our Robin Hood two-parter. Uh, you, you like you met Roger Reese. Yeah. And Ro uh, Roger Reese played the Sheriff of Rottingham. 
yes. in uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights yes. and many, many, many other things. Yes. Um, he was Nicholas Nickleby, like he did so many things. But you have like a personal relationship with him. I a- hung out one on one with Roger Reese for two or three one hour car rides. Um, and we talked and he was amazing. Yeah. And I miss him every day i'm just saying you have a personal connection to him yes. that we didn't really get into yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes that's when we talk about roger reese's being fantastic that's the history yes yes in, in a work context but like i have spent time one-on-one with roger reese yes yes uh oh man that's that's my biggest problem with it is that so much of it does not feel like it needs to be the adams family it just feels like something for a musical it feels very by the numbers yeah like let's make a musical uh the the mom is having Oh, 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 oh. She feels like she's wasted her life uh, because cause that's what women feel like. Yeah. Right? Write a song. Do a pretty song about and like, that. Yeah. And like Pugsley has a, a cute song about how like Wednesday's going to go away and so she won't torture him anymore. You know? But well, she, that's Adam's family. But, but it is. But like I'm just saying like sort of by the numbers, like everybody gets a song. Everybody yeah. gets a number. And the other thing that I felt about it too is that the funniest stuff in it, I think actually undermines it mm-hmm. as an honest uh, I'm going to keep talking about this. And I, I've talked about this almost every time that we've done a musical. Like I talked about it during Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I think the producers did really did Broadway a disservice. And I think it really set Broadway shows after on the path of constantly needing to break the fourth wall. Mm-hmm. Not that it didn't happen before. Yeah, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Where everything needs to have this kind of ironic detachment. Yeah. Where... You can have genuine feelings in a Broadway show. It's totally fine. Even if it's a comedy, you don't need the actors to acknowledge the fact that it's a show. And I feel like the thing that we value so much about the Adams Family, our Adams Family values, are that they are really, really genuine. Your eyes like rolled out of your head. (laughs) They're really genuine people. The emotion in an Adams Family story is genuine emotion, Mm -hmm. but it has that macabre twist that makes it the Adams family. Right. You need to have both of those things. This has the genuine emotion without the macabre twist. And it also has tons of jokes that break the fourth wall and get rid of that genuine, those genuine feelings. Yeah. They, they break the fourth wall. They get rid of the genuine feelings and like they serve, it's almost Brechtian. Like they serve to take you out of the story and remind you that you are an audience member physically situated in a Broadway theater because a lot of times what it is is they make jokes about people from New York. Yes. Right? Um, Which... This is for a New York audience or tourists who want to come see a Broadway show. Yeah, which which I feel like is just another little subtle thing that makes theater inaccessible to all to to all but a small portion of of the population, which is mm-hmm. unfortunate. Yeah. Um. Yes. Can I can I name one joke in particular? Sure. Um. We t- like we talked about before about how Grandmama is in some versions Gomez's mom mm-hmm. and in some versions is Morticia's mom. Yeah. What's the joke we get in this show? The joke is like she's. She's not your mother? I, or she's she's not my mother. I thought she was your mother. She's not my mother. I thought she was your mother. Who is she? And it's a very meta joke. It was funny. For people. But that's the thing. It is funny. Yeah. But I think it undermines an Adam's family story. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm totally fine with funny jokes, but they need to actually serve the story. And that's a funny joke that doesn't serve the story. And that's, yeah. the, that's the thing I don't like about it. There were funny jokes in it. <laughs> the only joke that I wrote down... Um. It's actually a funny joke, but I feel like the delivery is terrible. I think the direction was fucked up on this. Okay. Because, so this Normie's parents come to visit because it is the birdcage. Yeah. And at one point, the mom, who's very sweet, asks Gomez and Morticia if they have a little girl's room. And Gomez says, we used to, but we let them all go. God. Which is a really funny joke. And I could see Gomez, I could see Raul Julia delivering that joke. Yeah. But it has to be just genuine. We used to, but we let them all go. And then you move on to something right. else. That's the funny part. The funny oh, part is oh. that he would just say it and move on. But this is like he cracked himself up. Like Nathan Lane cracks himself up doing this and has this run of laughing at his own joke because he's trying to be funny. Yeah. And it is funny because it is a really funny joke. But it's not Gomez. But it's not Gomez. Yeah. That's I, my problem yep, with I it. I hear you. I hear you. And can I say like one other last thing about this for me? Sure grandmama yes funniest part of the show She's so funny so funny but in order to make her funny they have to undermine any family relationship that these people <laughs> have she becomes 
a meta character uh-huh. that is existing outside of the family because then you like they start to realize she may not even be a member of the family right. which is not really important she's hysterical but the types of jokes who who is she uh, Jackie Jackie Hoffman Hoffman yeah who's you know comedy royalty like lower comedy royalty yeah she's been around for a long time she's fantastic she's super funny and to be clear as written she's really funny because other actors have played this role but it's not, she's not grandmama. Yeah. It, these are not jokes that belong in an Adam's family story if you're trying to tell a genuine story about good people who happen to be weird. Yeah. Well, it's funny because um, the actor that played Lurch, um, we were like, that's just a it's just a tall guy. You just have to be tall. You just have to be tall. It's the only talent you need to have. And it's funny because we looked him up and you were like, oh, he's going to sing. And I was like, how do you know? And you were like, this guy's an opera singer. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is his that is his. So there's a guy named Zachary James in the original Broadway cast. Yeah. Um, but you looked up his resume and you were like, this guy's a legit opera singer. He just happens to be very tall. Yep. <laughs> and he did sing. Low and he did. Yes. And he's very good. He's good. And like, it's it's a funny show. But at the end of the day, I just think it's super hollow and like not a good Adams Family. It's not a good musical because it's not a good Adams Family musical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. I've already forgotten most of the songs. It's fun. I mean, like, listen... F- if if my kid was like in high school and they were putting on and he came home and he said like hey the musical this year is the Adams Family I'd be like that is so much fun like I bet you guys are gonna have a great time yeah like that's so, that's fun like it would be a fun high school musical to work on mm-hmm. but like I don't know as a Broadway musical it it didn't do it for me all right we got two more to talk about yes uh, really not even two more uh, one and a half more to talk about sure because in 2010 they also started production. They, I say, uh, Illumination Entertainment Mm -hmm. uh, got the rights and tried to make a stop motion movie at Universal of the Addams Family. Mm. So you're going to do something macabre. It's going to be kind of dark, a reboot of an old TV show. And who are you going to get for that? Who is going to direct that? I don't know. Tim Burton is going to direct that. Oh, God damn it. We dodged a bullet again. Hooray. <laughs> Tim Burton did not direct this. It ended up not happening, which, again, I am very glad about. I do. I just I don't want him doing The Addams Family. What can you do? I think he would mess it up. I think, you know, there's so many people out there who love Dark Shadows. Like mm-hmm. most the people. The new one? Like, it, no, 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 like the show. Oh, the show. The show Dark Shadows. I feel like you can divide the world into two types of people. People who have never watched Dark Shadows, which is most people, and people who love Dark Shadows. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of shows you can point to that towards. And I haven't, I, I just haven't heard from anybody who loves the show Dark Shadows that liked the movie he did at all. Yeah. Because he's just going to turn it into a Tim Burton thing. That's fair. And I don't think he's going to honor the original material. So I'm very glad he didn't do it. I was just thinking... I've always kind of wanted to watch Dark Shadows, and then I kind of went on a, a tangent in my own brain as you were talking, and I was thinking, maybe I'll rewatch The Twilight Zone. <laughs> I'm glad you went on a journey. Yeah, a little journey. We got one last one to talk about. Yeah. And then we can wrap this up. It's a very spooky episode. Spooky. We started recording this on October 30th. It is currently October 31st. Yeah. There's a break in the middle. There's a break. See if you can spot it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. Don't. In... 2019 last year a new adams family movie was released and i'll just throw this out there there's a sequel that's coming out next year that we're not gonna talk about or because, watch because well no we're not gonna watch it yeah because uh boy i didn't enjoy this one no i didn't care for it uh it is an animated and i remember when they first announced it and the trailer came out i was really excited about yeah, it I was because like, it's fun new adams family that's great and animated that like that makes sense uh, is, is tim burton directing it he's no. not okay cool I'm, I'm i'm interested you still have my attention and then they released the character designs mm-hmm. and one of the things that's so cool about it is that largely the character designs really harken back to the original strip yeah absolutely. which is cool some of them don't like lurch looks nothing like the strip yeah but gomez does yeah gomez, morticia, morticia definitely does, does wednesday does wednesday definitely does pugsley doesn't really yeah fester kind of does yeah and i was so i was really into it when i saw the picture originally then they released a trailer for it and i went Oh, no. Yeah. I've been down on this since the trailer. Yeah. Because the trailer does not do a good job at selling, did not do a good job on selling me that the voice actors were well cast at all. Mm -hmm. And I have one person in particular that I think is so poorly cast, so miscast in this. She did not get the direction she needed, apparently. Mm -hmm. I think she drags the entire thing down. And this is someone who I think is very, very good. And I have enjoyed her in many things. And that's Charlize Theron. Oh, no. As Morticia. Mm. I think it's embarrassing. It is awful. 
I hate her vocal performance as Morticia. She like kind of has an accent. Yeah, her accent was very muddled. She was like kind of has four different accents yeah. throughout the movie. She is not someone that should do vo. She she shouldn't do voiceover work. Mm. I don't think so. She's on camera talent, mm-hmm. and th- that's a that's an important thing. Lots of people are on camera talent, but then when you get in the voice booth, some people are good at it and some people are not. Yeah. And uh, do you do you disagree? Like, honestly, that I maybe I can think of nothing more damning than to say, I don't really remember what her performance was like at all. Yeah. So I guess I don't disagree. Like, I don't know what order to talk about stuff in. We could talk about the plot. We could keep talking about the actors. I want to talk about the character design for just a second because yeah, you yeah, already yeah. brought it up. I hated... I just hated how the people looked. Yeah. They, they were so... Just a pickle to look at. Just a pickle to look at. <laughs> they were just so spindly. I just yeah. hated the like spindly little skinny arms and legs on all on Wednesday and all the characters. I didn't like it. it I didn't care for it. The normies especially. Yeah. Like all the normies were like very, very skinny. Like skinny, but with, like kind of big butts. Like I just, it was it was weird looking. It was, yeah. it was funny looking. I, I really did not, like funny looking how? It's just, just, just funny looking. Yeah. It did it the character design did nothing for me yeah I, the opposite the opposite of nothing it was bad yeah um it was j- exactly the same thing that you're describing and i like, really couldn't stand it i just okay i want to talk about the plot for a second okay um you pointed this out as we were watching which is like a lot of sort of things aimed at kids these days the moral of the story is be yourself yes and it is good to accept people for who they are and it is bad not to do so which is something i can agree with in the abstract i can get behind that i can get behind it but in this case like i don't know it was that was the plot it was like these weird these weird beards we're gonna try to make them conform but no actually this one mean lady is the one that has to go and now all the adamses have moved to town and everybody's cool and like nothing about that is a bad lesson to learn but i guess i just don't think of the adams family as being something that i need to learn a lesson about like acceptance from can i ask you something sure if acceptance of people who are different had been the subtext of the movie Mm -hmm. do you think you would have had as much of a problem with it given the fact that it was completely the text of the movie yeah i guess exactly like there was no other plot like that was yeah. the plot. Like, can I describe the plot for a second? Sure. So we get a prologue at the beginning where we get to see Gomez and Morticia get married, mm-hmm. which is something that I don't think anyone has ever asked for. I certainly never asked I for it. I actually kind of thought it was kind of fun. No, it was okay. Okay. It was okay. So we see them get married and we see fe- like they get basically run out of town by all the townsfolk with knives and pitchforks. Yes. Because like they're monsters, I guess. Yeah, because they're weirdos. Because they're weirdos. But they're that's, freaks. that's never really been the Adams family like in no version of the story have people ever shown up with knives and pitch with like torches and pitchforks right. that's never really happened it's like old school monster stuff but like is it the adams family yeah i don't really know that that's what the story's about sure so they get run out of town and then they uh, go to a place where where everything is legal so they go to new jersey <laughs> and they find an abandoned haunted asylum and they like hit a guy on the road who's escaped from the asylum and, that's and they, they immediately make him their butler i don't i don't need to see how all these people they meet. collect fester like, they've got grandmama like like they make a life for themselves essentially in this place I, I, well fester shows up later fester doesn't live with them but right he helped them escape yes he helped them escape yeah he did and then we cut to 13 some odd years later they now have two kids they have wednesday and pugsley and they live up on this hill and the hill is surrounded by fog and always has been because there are these marshes below the hill that cause the fog. And then one day the fog lifts because the marshes have been drained to make way for new property and a new mm-hmm. development and a new town. The town is called, and this is what I'm talking about when I say that it's not subtext, it's text. <laughs> Do you remember the name of the town? It's called like conformity. It's called assimilation. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fucking stupid. Like it's it doesn't. Stupid. That's so fucking on the nose. And kids are smarter than that. Kids don't need. They don't. A. The kids don't know the word assimilation. <laughs> they, they. Sure they do. They know it from the Borg. Yes, because the children today are watching Star Trek: The Next Generation. They are. They're watching Star Trek Beyond and Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard. I think what we found is that people weren't watching Star <laughs> Trek Beyond, which is why there hasn't been another movie. Which bumps me out because it's the best one. Anyway. 
the town is called Assimilation. Yeah. And it, the development it has been made by Margot Needler, who's a TV remodeler voiced by Allison Janney. We haven't talked about any of the other people in the cast, but yeah. I'll get to her. So she basically built the town. She does like extreme home makeover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's all these people there who are all these normies who want to live in a town called Assimilation, which is, again, fucking stupid. And suddenly, because they drained the swamp, the fog is gone, and they all realize that there's this giant, creepy, haunted mansion up on the top of this giant hill above the town. And her whole thing is, like, we have to get rid of that because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make my town look bad. And which is weird because a giant foggy mountain apparently wasn't going to make the town look bad. But like, anyway, it's a kid's movie. It's a kid's movie. It's a kid's movie. It's a kid's movie. Literally a kid's movie. Repeat this to myself. It's a kid's movie. Literally a kid's movie. You're going to have a tough, like the next 10 years is going to be tough if you can't like kind of distance yourself from what a kid's movie is. Don't tell me my business. (laughs) So that's the plot. And the whole thing is like. The Adamses are like, oh, a town. This is great. By the way, uh, we're also going to have the entire Adams clan are going to visit our house because of reasons. Oh, because it's it's Wes- it's um it's Pugsley's bar mitzvah. Did you say Wesley? You still have Star Trek: The Next Generation on the brain? Maybe it's okay. Pugsley's it's Pugsley's bar mitzvah. So it's Adams bar mitzvah. Yeah. What do they call it? I, I can't even remember. I don't know. Mazurka. Mazurka. A mazurka. And so Pugsley has to. There's all this, there are all of these plot threads that don't go anywhere. Like, Gomez hasn't really prepared Pugsley for the mazurka. Yeah. He has to do like a sword dance or something. Yeah. Like, it kind of goes nowhere. And it turns out that Pugsley wasn't prepared for the uh, traditional mazurka. But the fact that he is like a demolitions expert is the thing that allows him to prove to the Adams clan that he is a word, that he's a man. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it doesn't really go in any direction that is worthwhile or makes it feel good. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, all these plot threads kind of go nowhere. Like, Wednesday makes a friend because she wants to go to school. So she makes a friend. And, of course, the friend she makes is Margot Needler's daughter. And she turns goth. Yeah, but that doesn't go anywhere. Like, the friend kind of disappears in the last 20 minutes of the movie. Yeah. It no None of the plot threads go anywhere. Yeah. So, like, the plot is just kind of a mess. And the parts of it I remember are too on the nose to be enjoyable. And it is, it, kids deserve better. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the cast? I don't really know who the cast was. Well, let me tell you who was in the cast. Go for it. So Gomez was Oscar Isaac. Yeah. Who's very good. Uh-huh. He's very good. He's okay. I actually I... thought his Gomez was okay. He's doing Raul Julia. Yeah. Like he definitely is. Yeah. But I think he was doing it in a way that was more authentic than what Nathan Lane was doing. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, he is like legitimately He's... like born in Guatemala, raised by Cuban Guatemalan parents. In Miami. In Miami. Yeah. Like, I think he moved to the U.S. when he was five. Yeah. Um, we just looked all that up. Just I did some research. Just for- I had to do some research. We want to make sure we get it right. Yes. But, like, he's fine. I actually think he's fine. I think the problem with Gomez is the story. I don't think the problem with Gomez is the Gomez. Uh, Morticia is Charlize Theron. I think it's previously discussed. just a terrible performance. I feel really bad about it. Chloe Grace uh, Moretz is Wednesday. She's okay. She's fine. She's just way too old to play Wednesday. It's yeah. definitely that thing where it's like an adult doing the voice of a child. Yeah, which I think probably when she was cast, they were like, oh, yeah, she's a child actor, but like she is. She was a child she was. actor. Actor. Yeah. Not anymore. Now she's, she's an, an actor. Adult. Yeah. Uh, Finn Wolfhard is Pugsley. Yeah. Finn, you know what film Finn Wolfhard? Yeah. What was he? He's in? in Stranger Things. Okay. Yeah. 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 He's a b- bunch of things now. Again, way too old. Uh-huh. Like the voice coming out of this tiny child <laughs> is way too old. And that's you can do that. Like we love Bob's Burgers. And one of the things in Bob's Burgers is that all of the kids are voiced by adults. Right. And that's just how it is. Right. But it's like oh, it's for more humorous effects. Right. And this one like. We've had Christina Ricci playing Wednesday. We've had kids playing Wednesday. We don't need adults playing Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, and and Pugsley. Uh, Bette Midler is Grandmama Adams. She's pretty good. She's just doing Jewish, yeah, though. Yeah, but it's pretty funny. It is pretty funny, but, like, it's not... She's not Grandmama Adams. I understand. One of the directors played Lurch, uh-huh. um, which is kind of fun. He was fine, except... Oh, this made me so angry. <laughs> Every time someone rings the door, he says, Lurch opens it and rang. goes... Uh, hang on, I'm gonna actually make my voice sound lower. All right. You rang. That's what it sounds like. Uh huh. The thing that's fucked up about that though, and the thing that makes me so angry, <laughs> is that just <laughs> just so from a, angry. just from a writing standpoint, you rang is a question. Yeah. Which means like you have called me here. What is it? Yeah. And if he has is the butler and he's been called, <laughs> stop for a second. Let me say this because it's important. <laughs> If he's been called into the room as a butler, he doesn't know why he's been called there. Therefore, his, the first thing out of his mouth is going to be something like, what do you want me to do? 
for instance, you rang, what can I do for you? But when you're answering the door, you already know, you know why they're, you know why they're ringing the doorbell because they want you to open the door. They either want to come in or they want to tell you something. That's how it works. You rang doesn't work as a catchphrase when you're answering the door and he does it multiple times. As someone who's gone on a number of petty rants on this podcast. Yes, I understand this is my pettiest rant I've ever done. (laughs) I think this is the pettiest one yet, but listen, I support it. I just think like, it shows both a respect of the original material and a misunderstanding of the original material. I think it is poor writing and I hate it. Ugh. Uh, Martin Short and Catherine O'Hara are in this movie they're, briefly. They're cute. They're it, really cute. They play grandpa and grandma frump. But like they're Mort- dead. Morticia calls them like it, with a crystal ball. Yeah. You know, does a seance and they're very funny. Um, I have zero problem with them. No beef. And there is one person that I have saved and that is Fester. Fester is played by Nick Kroll. Mm-hmm. And for anyone who watches Big, Big mouth. mouth. Uh, Fester just sounds like Coach Steve with a lisp. Exactly like Coach Steve with a lisp. He's doing the same voice as Coach. Is Steve. all very very nearly identical. And here's the thing: is Fester funny? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Coach Steve is funny, and honestly, like they're not that different as characters. No, they really aren't because they're just gross, weird people. Gross, weird man babies who. <laughs> Are just the creepiest people who have listed. God, if you're not watching Big, Big Mouth, please watch Big Mouth. It is so good. Yeah, I understand. There's a like a little backlash on Big Mouth, but we we think it's fun. What's we the, like what's it. the backlash? I think people just think it's not good. I I don't know. I mean, I know there was the thing that happened with Jenny Slate. Yeah, there there's. But I thought that was handled really well. Yeah, I I think people think it's not good. I think I think there's I think there's a little backlash from people that don't appreciate it and we it's 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 good it's funny is uh i here's the deal i'm open to continuing the conversation in a different vein if anyone wants to tell me why i'm wrong to love it because i love it and it's one of my favorite shows yeah i think it's incredible uh nick kroll's great but it's one of these things where like yeah he's great it's good casting but he's doing nick kroll and the character of fester doesn't go anywhere yeah um even though he ends up hooking up with margot needler at the end of it do you remember that? I do remember that. Which actually does the thing that we kind of made us sad about Debbie and Adam's family values. Yeah. That like she actually kind of fits in with them. Yeah. And like Margaret's not a not an amazing person. She kind of fits in with them a little bit. Yeah. Even though she's not an amazing she's she's a mean spirited person. She's mean spirited. And so that's a problem. They're nice people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the whole thing of the movie is that it's all about acceptance. And it is text, not subtext. Yeah, and like the whole extended clan moves to town and everybody's cool with it. Yeah. And there's going to be another one. In the end. In 2021. Yeah, well, maybe. It's just, I just think it's such a poorly made movie. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't like their spindly arms. That was my yeah. biggest problem, honestly. Like, I just didn't like how they looked. I don't want to, I don't want to go off on like criticizing it technically, but like as animated movies go, it is very poor. Yeah. I feel. And what a bummer to end on. Yes, I'm sorry. We always do this. The last one we do, maybe we should think about doing it in some way other than chronological because we always end on a, bum- a bummer. Sometimes we rank things by like how much we enjoyed them. Yeah. But I think the thing you miss with that is context. Like, yeah, I think we need, that's what it is. You have to have the context. We have to talk about Adam's family and Adam's family values to talk about any of these. Exactly. I think, I think when we first started... We tried to do it in different ways, and we were just like, well, it's kind of like this thing that came before that we're we'll talk about later, and then we realized that didn't work. Yeah. You know. So, so we end on a bummer. Is. Yeah. But how about we back up? Would you like to do some quadrants? Sure. Some spooky, spooky quadrants. Spooky. All right. 1964, Adam's Family TV show. Do you think they cared about the source material? Yes. Do you think they did a good job? Yes. Yeah, it's a great show. Real, real good. Um, we're not Hanna Barbera cartoons. We, we didn't can't watch. talk about. Yeah, we haven't watched them. 1991 uh, Adams Family movie. Do you think they cared about the source material? Which is like, let's just define it as the comic strip. Yeah. Uh, yes, I do because there are little little touches that are just straight from the comic strip, directly from it. Yeah. Did, was it successful? Yes. Okay. Um. <laughs> 1992 Adam's Family the pinball game did they care about the source material I don't know I'm gonna say no I think they cared about the movie did they do a great job you say so it is the best selling pinball machine of all time and it is incredible oh my god um, Adam's Family Values 1993 yeah uh, did they care about the source material I mean it's the same people so clearly yes. yeah clearly was it successful yes even more so than the original excellent uh, Adam's Family Reunion do you think they cared about the source material no no do you think they were aware of like the TV show no. I think they were aware oh, of it. Oh, aware of it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Whatever. Was it successful? No. No. The new Adams Family. 
Do you think they cared about any source material? They cared about the show. They cared about the 60s show. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Was it successful? I Yes. As a kid's show? And also, yes. <laughs> no, what we always say that was it successful in what it was trying to be. It was trying to be a shitty kid's show. Sure. 100% it was a shitty kid's show. Yeah. Um, And I th- it looks like they had fun doing it. Yeah. Was it successful for us? No. I'm going to say no. I enjoyed no. <laughs> it, but no, it's, it, it was not successful. The 2010 Adams Family Musical, Um, again, given that our experience of it was not ideal, mm-hmm. do you think they cared about the source material? I'm not sure they did. I'm given to understand they did. Okay. Um, I, from what I've heard of them talking about it, they really wanted they really wanted to make it clear that they were adapting the cartoon strip and not just adapting the movie. Yeah. Well, and in they, that case, I feel like they did a worse job because I didn't see anything from the original. But cartoon. I think they cared. Okay. I don't think it was successful. I though. don't think it was successful. 2019 animated movie. Yeah. The Adams Family. Uh-huh. Do you think they cared about the source material? I mean, they they use the character design from the yeah. comic, and there's jokes directly from it. Sure. And jokes. They, there's Every- it's. It's very single, reverential of every version of Adam's family. That's every come single version has the joke, unhappy darling. Yes, yes, completely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, which is from the comic. Was it successful? No, I no. didn't like it. It wasn't good. I really didn't it wasn't like even it. like fun bad. It was just, it, and it wasn't like, like painful to watch. It was just kind of boring and dumb. I didn't like it. And I'm we get sorry. to end on it. We get to end on it. Yeah. Happy, happy Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> Well, this has been Adapter Parish. If you'd like to find us online, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AdaptCast. And if you tweet about the show, don't forget to use the AdaptCast hashtag. You can join our groups on Facebook and Goodreads, and you can also find and follow me on Letterboxd. If you have anything to say that's longer than a tweet, you can always send an email to AdapterParishCast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, there are three great ways that you can do it. First, tell a friend. Second, a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice would be greatly appreciated. And third, we are on Patreon. We've got a uh, patron-only bonus show. We have a patron-only community that's super fun. We'd love for you to check it out at patreon.com slash adaptcast. Petite. No, that's fucked up. It's stupid. Uh, These are just words. You're just saying words now, Vic Mizzy. (laughs) But seriously, if you haven't voted yet and it's still Tuesday, you should go vote because four more years of this would truly be spooky. I don't know how that's going to age. Hopefully well. (laughs) We'll look back on it and laugh. Ah. Uh, Everybody's everyone. No, for real, though, like everyone take care of yourselves um, because like there's no version of this situation where everything ends in like wine and roses. Like this is tough and it's different levels of hard for everybody and we just we care about all of you and we really hope that everyone not only takes care of their neighbor but takes the time to take care of themselves as well um because we're all in this together and we we just we hope everybody's okay because this is pretty rough right now uh but now that i've now that i've gotten a little did i get too real for you, you just there brought down the mood i i mean it though i know and like it's i just don't know how to follow that it's you don't have to follow it okay goodbye everybody bye everybody happy halloween and uh you're all